recommendation. Can, can we go, uh, Madam President? Yes. I, I'm going to suggest uh, that we go ahead and uh, uh, am amend the motion and be a still talk about it, but not vote. Uh, pretty much, you know what? I. It's an info item as it is, right? It's an info item as it is. So, so can can what what is the parliamentary procedure to to a, to a, to adjust? I don't know how to adjust um, what what we're discussing in the item. Right, but it comes in as an info, and then the next meeting we vote on it. So this is my well. There's concern. no need to vote at all. That we're not voting. We wouldn't be voting today anyway. It's not I an am, action item. Or the next I time. Am. And there's no vote ever needed really on this. It's yeah. just information. But what you could do is um, to have the discussion, and uh, as part of that discussion, give give the board, or rather, give the district, tell us what you would like to see next time based on the con conversation that you have today, and then we could bring that back at the next meeting. So, so, so I keep my motion. Okay. And. and um, when we get to this item, we can discuss it at either, um, I don't know, table it or ask for more information when we get there. That, that's my, my recommendation. I, I second that recommendation. Okay, so at this point we vote. That's how I see it. So am I correct? Yes, you are. Thank you. All right, let's vote. Okay, it, you like, have you joined the meeting? I, I did, I'm trying to join, I am joining it right here and my name's on it and everything, but there's no, um, voting thing on my on here can you log out of the meeting and log yeah. back in then, then, yeah let me try to do that what maybe we can vote by hand i don't know and I, then I, I could log on lock back log back in okay okay i will do How that does right else feel about that vote by i'll log out and go back up okay so we're going to vote by hand on this one um so board member yes the pena yes Board member Cruz Gonzalez? Yes. Board member Greer? Yes. Board member Arianas? No. Okay, and uh, board member, I, I'm gonna go ahead and go with it so we can hash it out when we hit it. So it passes four to one. Okay, and so next we are going to go to item 5.0. 5.1, recognition of Gladstone senior Zamina Escobar. Oh, and I forgot the student board member. <laughs> student board member, how do you vote? Yes. Yay, I am so sorry. I'm gonna write that in big letters on my PC. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, Recognition and awards, recognition of Gladstone Senior, Zamina Escobar. Is Jimena here? She should be. I saw her text message saying she was in the meeting. Jimena? She said her video was muted. Hold on. I apologize for the mispronunciation of your name, Jimena. She just said that she's on, on my phone, so. What's her, her name? Her, her name is Jimena Escobar. Uh-oh. I'm looking. Because I don't have a Jimena in the list. There's, what about Axel? Can you um, let me? I'm going to ask her what her login name is. Is it maybe it's Axel? Let's try that one. Uh, yeah, she's Axel. Okay. Correct. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hello. I don't know how to 
my face isn't being shown either. Um, hi, yeah. Yeah, it's my dad's account, <laughs> by the way. Bottom of the screen, him on, on the left hand side, uh, share a video. It's not giving me the option of um, showing my face, it's just telling me to mute. Maybe, um, can you, like, on, like, can you, the person that's hosting it, I think yeah. they have to give me the access. I'm oh. trying, but she's, there it is. Okay, there we go. We have your. Yeah, there we go. Hi. Oh, there she Hello. is. <laughs> Hi. There she is. Okay, so we're recognizing you. Take a minute. Wonderful video that you did. I saw it. I thought it was so cool. It was awesome. So, so how do you feel about this? Is the first time we've ever done it video. So your experiment. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Jimena, maybe you can tell us a little bit what inspired you to do this. Um, yeah. So I definitely just uh, because with with all of this going on, there was a lot of like talk of 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 like people being like, oh, you know, like it doesn't matter that your senior year isn't isn't happening. Like there's people dying, you know? So it, it almost like, it made me feel at least like as if my feelings weren't validated. And I knew that that's how a lot of seniors felt. So that's why I wanted to make the video because I wanted to like show the seniors and also like other people that like whatever you're feeling is so valid and that maybe it might not be the same as, as, as you know, as a person's life, but that doesn't diminish your feelings so that's that's kind of like thought that I was that I had when I was making the video but just making like people's feelings known and just like so they know that they're heard you know oh, that that's very nice can you all you know I have to say when I first saw the video your principal sent it to me this is Dr. Kaminsky speaking mm -hmm. and when I first saw it I at first I thought my goodness is this something that somebody purchased and but you know and because it looks so professional I thought maybe somebody else had done it except that I could tell by the story and the pictures that clearly it was reflecting glass in high school. So how did you develop those skills? Because you just did an amazing job. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. It just something like I've always, my dad has always been into like um, film. So he's always had cameras. And um, when I entered high school, I started, um, I don't know, like I had a, I have a YouTube channel. So I started making videos and this year I, I wanted to make a senior video. So I started filming a lot of like the rallies, like I, I started filming rallies like last year, my junior year. So I had a lot of footage from from that, but it's always been something that I that I grew to be passionate about. Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. So can, can we see your video? Mark, can you can you uh, have it play for us? Um, does anyone? Have a link and I can play it off the link. Or Arturo, do you have it? Do you want us to send you like an email with it? Or um, Mr. Fernandez, do you have a do you have I, I'll 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 look for it again. It's on the YouTube channel that I sent to Arturo. Well, while we're waiting for that, uh, Jimena, uh, would you like to speak about how you and a couple of uh, friends started the film club at Gladstone High School. Oh, sure, Nathan. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it was we, our sophomore year. Um, we took chemistry with uh, Mr. Rogers and he, we started this like we had to make a short film. Um, we had to have like a lab. So and then like the story was ours. So we started we started making the, the film and as we started making it and I started getting the script and just um, filming and directing it. It just we realized that like we really wanted to like keep on doing it. Um, and we just, we, I don't know, we, I feel like we all like that whole group, we just kind of fell in love with, with just like filming and all that stuff. So we, Nathan and I were really committed to, to making a film club. So like other people had kind of a voice. Cause like, um, you know, at, at our school, there's not a lot of like, you know, film program, you know, there's not film, there's, there aren't any film programs. So I wanted to, we wanted to kind of be a voice for those people that, that want, that are interested in the arts and everything, but we don't really have access to that. So that's how we we started um, the film club. We got in touch with Mr. Mr. Haig, and yeah, we just started making short films and just yeah, that's that's how the whole film club started. <laughs> great, great. 
Yeah. Jimena, this is um, board member Yolanda Rodriguez Pena. I seen your video and your passion. I felt your passion. I mean, it was so beautiful. I mean, it made me cry. I'm gonna cry again. But um, I know that it was very touching and I know it came straight from your heart. It was beautiful. Thank you for that. That means, that means a lot, thank you. Because like my goal was to, uh, you know, for somebody, so like our, all of our feelings are valid. You know, all seniors, yeah. like everyone that's going through, like even, not even just seniors, but anyone who's going through it, just to, just to like, for, so you know that your feelings are valid. Because with everything going on, it almost feels like as if we should be like quiet about how we feel. But if that's not true, like yeah. your feelings are so valid and however you feel is so important, you know, regardless of anything that's going on. Um, and that's what I wanted to, to show. I felt it, I'll tell you, I felt it. I, I also want to, would just want to tell you too, that when I saw the video, it, it really, as a parent of a senior myself, um, I've had, you know, just a really hard time myself, um, you guys being seniors and being dealt this card that is inevitable and we're all going through this. And as I was watching your video, I'm reminded of the talent and just how amazing you are and in, in sharing just through video, um, the, like you said, the valid feelings that and personal feelings that you, you share and I, I can't wait to see what, what else you come up with because everything that you do is just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you <laughs> so much. Did you get a lot of hits or whatever they call that? The kids, what is that call it hits? I mean, people viewing, I don't know. Yeah. People um, viewing it, yeah. <laughs> a lot of views. Um, yeah. <laughs> so on because I posted it on on my IGTV and then like um I don't know like uh, like other other Instagram accounts from like Gladstone also posted it so like <clears throat> you know it built up but on my Instagram I think I got like four thousand views wow. and like on my YouTube I got I got like almost it's almost at a thousand so yeah, wow. yeah oh this is a video <laughs> oh beautiful. Oh, the audio is in. The words. Can we help with the audio? Oh, that's that's another video. <laughs> you want me to try? Because I think I can share my screen. Okay. Yeah, you, can, you can share your screen. Let me see if I have the video just on my... I, I just can't log into my account at the same time as I'm projecting to YouTube. Okay, um, I can try. Um, okay. Um, okay, I think, okay, I have the video ready. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and share that screen. Share screen, desktop, share. Can you guys, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just, okay. Hopefully, hopefully it works. Cause I've tried this with my friends and it works. Hopefully. Um, I think, I think it's, can you guys hear it? Yes. yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, I think it's crazy to be experiencing all this. This was our senior year and it all stopped so abruptly. Never once did we imagine what this year would hold. We came into senior year with expectancy, imagining how we would be able to drive anywhere with our friends, going to football games, getting more involved with sports and rallies, picking our dresses or tuxes for the greatest dance of the year, dancing the night away at prom, possibly preparing speeches for graduation, applying to colleges, getting accepted, getting ready to make the most memories this year, promising ourselves that senior year would be our year. But alas, life had different plans. When the first inklings of this pandemic began to occur, nobody expected it to impact us the way it did. We saw it as somebody else's problem until this, this became our problem. And in a few days, the world that we knew was gone. Stay home. Today, Governor Gavin Newsom confirmed that California schools will not reopen by the end of this academic year. Events got canceled. There was talk of school being shut down for a few weeks until those few weeks turned into a few months and into a whole year. Dances got canceled, rallies got canceled, schools closed, goodbyes were said, masks were put on, six feet apart was enforced, streets got quieter, houses shut their doors, and our senior year ended. 
Yeah, it sucks. It almost feels like hanging out with friends, hugging people, going out is nothing but a distant memory. But this too will come to pass. And I strongly believe that things happen for a reason. And I also believe that life is now. And that if we decide to live in the ifs or the what ifs or in the past, we'll end up hurting ourselves, but we'll also never see what life is teaching us now. And we'll never see the good out of this circumstance. And it sounds cliche to say, but we are distant, but connected. We connect with those that we love the most through screens. And honestly, those that you still wanna do life with is those that you're still in touch with. I believe that now we have the ability to be more in tune with who we are. We, we have time to to do what we never thought we had time for we have time to do what we love and we have time to start new things so yes it can feel like our senior year being able to graduate doing our dances doing life with our friends and doing things that you would expect to do as a senior was robbed and if you feel like that your feelings are so valid and they matter a lot but I think that we need to change our perspective. Instead of looking at it as something that was taken from us, we need to see it as a game that we just simply weren't able to play. Because honestly, this is what we have right now. We have more family time. We have more time to connect with our friends. We have more time to check up on those that we love. And we have more time for ourselves. We have more time to discover what we're passionate about and what we love. Our senior year is gone, but our memories aren't. And we still have so much now. So will you choose to focus on what's gone and over with? Or will you choose to use your time for something that could potentially impact and change the course of your life forever? Wow. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very beautiful. Oh, I never know what to say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Sorry. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, for taking the time um, to, th to collect your own thoughts and, and organize them in a way that can impact all of us. It really, um, you know, for all the messages we all have heard throughout this time, most of them have been pretty much just doom and gloom. But to hear one that speaks to, yeah, of course, we all have these feelings, but here's how we can change it into something that will make a difference for ourselves and for others is very, very impactful and mature way beyond your years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. And it was probably very important to even just one person who was really, maybe if somebody was just feeling that, that and they saw your feelings and realized feelings are the same and it's all valid, it's okay. You know, it, I, I loved it. Wow, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Hemina, and just wanna say thank you so much. Um, sim similar to what others are saying for your perspective, um, you, you have a, you have a unique perspective that you're you're speaking from, um, and and sharing that here amongst us, but but then also for for your your, you know, friends and and peers to be able to hear as well, um, and find solidarity in is 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 beautiful. So thank you for, um, not only your talent, um, but for you using your talent, um, in, in such a way that that you know even brings about some kind of hope and and um, um just just incredible perspective to to those that are that are going through it with you. So, thank you. Yep. And then I guess we're all talking, so I'm just going to jump into Himena. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Um, I'll, like Yolanda, I'm chuffing up a bit, but I'll just say that um, I, I really appreciate this, and, I, and it's so beautiful. Um, I, I really can't express how beautiful it is. I think it, I think it captures how we all feel. So thank you. Um, and it just just quickly, do you, so if you're a senior, do you know what you're doing next year? Please share that with us. Yeah. Um, so I'm still like in the, like I'm still kind of. Uh, like you know swimming in the pool <laughs> kind of now because I'm not really sure um I don't know I I'm the, deciding between like maybe Viola um you know going to, to like it has a it has a good film program so maybe Viola or maybe Cal State LA or Fullerton or maybe a two-year I'm still kind of you know weighing out my options and like talking to my parents about it but yeah I'm like I, I'm definitely gonna major in film though that's what I'm gonna major in I think you need to go to Paramount Studios and uh, be a producer or something already. You're so young, but your your mind is so yeah. big. You know, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, it's really really nice. I, I think that it should be shown at every high school, honestly, to let the kids know that you know what we feel it, we know it, yep. right? I, I have somebody, um, real quick, since it's an open meeting, I have somebody here who would like to say something. Hey, Yimena. Hey, Nathan. Congratulations. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Nathan. You got this. 
you know, I, I, I just totally off subject, but I love it when your children, Chilomine, Gabby, and uh, Adrian, it, I think that adds so much to our meetings because <laughs> you can see the human humanity in everybody. Anyway. Jerry, I can bring my cat, Jerry, if you want me to. <laughs> Yes, please. You want to see my gato? She's right here. You want to down. see the gato? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel there's my dog. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, anybody else will have anything to say? We're good. Thank you. All righty. Um, so we will go. Good to luck. 6.0, 6.1. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on agenda and non agenda items. Individual speakers may be allowed up to three minutes to address the board on any agenda or non-agenda item. Prior to addressing the board, please fill out the request to speak public comment blue card and submit it to the board secretary. So here we go. Mark, nobody? There's one. All right. We'll give a few seconds for others. All right, I think there's just one. Um, everyone, if you click the raise your hand button, then we will take down your names and then you'll be added to the queue. Okay, I think there's just one. Okay. I, I will open up the line. Okay. Good evening. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Am I good to start or should I wait a minute or? You're good to go. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, good evening, board members. Uh, I want to thank you again, first of all, for um, <clears throat> the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I want to also thank our uh, district leadership for their handling of uh, distance learning and willing to work with us teachers and getting input from us on issues, whether it's grading or whatever it might be. So I want to uh, thank the district for and for opening up those um, weekly meetings also so that all of us can get together and share our, our ideas and uh, try to make the best out of the situation. Um, also want to congratulate Jimena as a father of a senior who and my daughter just heard that she uh, will be doing her graduation on a camera with her cap and gown just to get the diploma and she was very very disappointed to hear that so the, the pain is real here at this uh at this house too i i do want to bring up an area of concern and that was uh again one that was addressed at the beginning of this meeting and uh i understand this is just an informational bit with the uh proposals for k-8 but uh, I am concerned, as many other teachers were in our um, one of our meetings that we had as a, as a union, uh, with, with the uh, the fact that that was put in there and even billed as a K eight um, model. And looking at Foothill, as it was unclear whether it was TK and then middle school or TK through middle school, and it was unclear. But the fact that seven twelve wasn't even in the mix or. Uh, figuring out how to consolidate to middle schools was not even in the mix. It, it, it seemed to reinforce the idea among many teachers that the district has already made a foregone conclusion to go K-8. Now that may not be true, but that is the appearance that we are, we are seeing. And it is something that many of us, especially in middle school, while we're not opposed to K-8 schools per se, we are opposed to eliminating middle schools altogether in favor of the K-8. So I, again, I hope that the board, the district, you will continue to have discussions on this issue. Seek input from us as teachers, please, especially middle school teachers, middle school parents. And uh, I think middle school is something worth saving. Something worth saving. 
and not uh, <clears throat> worth discarding uh, in, in favor of a questionable model. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, we'll move on next to uh, Meg Savala. Meg here? Yes, she's there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I too want to um, thank the board for this opportunity to ensure that all of us get to see the board meetings and participate this way in the board meetings. And so thank you very much. Um, during this difficult time, um, it is comforting to me to know that we're still doing this, even though it's hard. So thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to kind of uh, reiterate what Andrew just said, but more in the sense of open communication and transparency. I understand that this presentation from looking at the attachment to our, um, item 10.2, very specifically as clarified by Linda, um, is about talking about the costs of portables and things like that. However, if you really look at that item, one, um, that attachment has nothing to do with the description or quote unquote recommendation that is in the item. And also when Linda met with us union presidents, union leaders um, on Tuesday last week to go through the agenda, this was not attached to that. And so we were not told that there was going to be any such review of costs of portables or anything related to quote unquote the, the K-8 process. And when I say process, meaning that how this presentation is labeled. And believe me, once somebody found this because it was not readily kind of posted since it was not identified as a K-8 item on the agenda, my phone started to blow up. And so I would have really appreciated finding out about this um, before today. Um, or that it was written in a way that was clear so that those people with concerns about the K-8, um, the increase of numbers of K-8 you know, sites um, could have discussed it or showed up and given their comment. Also, the presentation itself um, has five, five elementary schools named and one middle school named um, with costs specific to those schools. It's very concerning to me that the way this presentation has been put together, the inference is that decisions have been made. Now, I heard you say in your comments prior to the beginning of the meeting that, or at the beginning of the meeting, that no decisions have been made, and that's great. But when information is presented this way, um, it very much has the inference that it's a done deal. And that's frustrating for me on the other end because I knew nothing about this presentation. So um, I would like to ask in the future um, that like the things are communicated ahead of time um, so that I can field questions accurately. And two, that, it's, that these items are presented in a way that clearly designates what the topic is about. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Meg. Okay, anybody else? Is that it, Mark? I don't see any more um, hands. Okay. So with that, we will go ahead and move forward to comments from the board. That's item 7.0, 7.1, comments and requests by the board. Uh, board member Cruz Gonzalez. All right, thank you. Um, I'll go first, I guess. Um, so just a couple things. I know we just had a meeting last week, but I just want to reiterate again. I just, I, I just can't under, understate how grateful I am to all the, all the work that over and beyond that all of our staff are doing to support us. It's, I, I think every day I hear something else about something wonderful that somebody's doing and feeling like our staff is really um, going above and beyond. So I just want to express that appreciation once more. Um, and so, um, and there's a couple other things that I just, that I wanted to um, talk about. Um, the first being, um, I think that right now, obviously we're playing, um, we're thrown into this crisis situation and we're, and you know, I think 
amazing collaborative planning in terms of what we're doing now. I, I hope that at some point soon we start transitioning to think about what's going to happen in the summer and the fall. And the reason I say that there's already been several comments made at the state level by the governor around, you know, thinking what may happen in the fall. And so I just want to make sure that we are prepared and prepared to have those conversations collaboratively so that we can move forward because um, I, I think it's just very unclear um, what what is going to, what's going to happen in the fall? Um, the other the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and I'm really glad that that Andrew Alvarez mentioned graduation. Um, I do think um, I've I've heard examples of other districts where they've surveyed the seniors to see what they wanted, whether it's a hybrid or only in person later on delayed. So I'm wondering. I know we've already had conversations and made decisions about that, but I'm wondering if there's a way to make sure that we are. Um, communicating with our seniors and asking them what they want because it, it really is their celebration and and if it's already happening I mean excuse me for, for saying this because I just want to make sure that their input um, that we that we have them lead us I think I think Jimena's video shows us that there's a lot of strength and knowledge in our seniors and so I want to make sure that we respect what they want so that's it for me okay thank you uh, board member Rodriguez Pena yes um, good evening everyone I want to congratulate um, Azusa Unified, um, Azusa High School and Glastone High School for three years in a row. They're receiving the US News and World Report Best High Schools, uh, ranking the silver medal three years in a row. That, that's really good. So I, I like to thank um, the administration, the staff, students, and parents. Way to go, Aztecs and Gladiators. And also, I want to um, congratulate the students. Uh, Glastone High School had a, it was really neat, an online certificate of recognition. And I, they gave a certificate to like 66 students. And I want to congratulate those students. And it was nice because the teachers all chimed in when they gave a certificate and talked uh, positive points on the, on the students, why they were receiving this award. And uh, uh, and, and students were also online and they were like, you know, really happy and saying thank you and, and, and for teachers acknowledging them. I think it's really important that we don't forget them just because we don't see them doesn't mean we don't remember them. We need to let them know that, you know what, they still deserve their awards, just like the seniors still deserve to be uh, acknowledged. So I wanted to thank um, Ms. Bullock, the administration, counselors, counselors chimed in too, teachers and students for making this award um, assembly possible online and you know um i know the encouraging words did did, did um help the students because the teachers are very passionate and maybe they're missing their kids now you know and and it's really nice you know and, and i hope to see everyone someday and, and again yeah i'd like to reiterate also with to thank everyone you know, staff students parents administration board members for for well, I don't know it's running smooth because I'm, I'm not running the ship. So it's easy for me to say, but you know, it seems like, and I'm getting positive from parents and students about, you know, their, their learning and their picking up their lunches and, and stuff. And, and I just, I, again, I, I like to thank everyone that's, that's included in participating. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, board member Greer. Hey, so just a, a couple things. One, yeah, um, in, in regards to our graduating class and, and what we how, how we can honor our graduating class, I know that there have been some conversations at, um, around collaboration at the city level. Um, and so I would definitely want to see us move forward with some of that. Um, uh, as well, at, you know, for, I know that there's been conversations, I should say, at a city level about our um, seniors. Mm -hmm. I'm also wanting us to be mindful of our eighth grade um, group of students as well. Um, and, and then yes, having that, that, that further conversation from what are the recommendations and what are the thoughts, what are some of those options, ways that we can honor um, our, our graduating and or promoting classes uh, for this, this year. Um, then also I, I was gonna talk here about, again, bringing forward, you know, wanna make sure that we're keeping a, the deadline for our five-year plan in front of us and what that will look like. I think that there will be space to talk about that a little bit later when we, um, when we get into the conversation that we kind of started a, a little bit earlier. Um, last thing I'll add is um, I, wanna, I wanna share something and, I'm, I, and I don't quite have the logistics figured out, but, but it's something that I wanna share out and invite uh, um, those within the community to, to be part of. Um, prior to all this, this you know, social distancing and everything happening, 
one of the things that I was wanting to do was was to make myself uh, periodically available, you know, whether it was at a coffee shop or something, to be able to have some conversations and, and open up to, um, to to just have some space that's available for people to come in and sh and and share any mm -hmm. concerns or celebrate, you know, whatever's going on. Um, and so that has been put on pause, obviously, because of what is going on. But I'm, I'm wanting to move forward still doing something a, a, um, re remotely, mm -hmm. virtually. I'm sure you all already have your fair share of Zoom or Hangout meetings, just like I do. And so I'm potentially throwing out a, a, another one. Um, but uh, on April 11th, that's a day where I, I don't quite have the logistics figured out. So, so stay tuned. I'll, I'll figure out how to send it out, whether through social media or, or sharing out some more information at the next meeting. But on April 11th, I want mm -hmm. um, in the evening, I'm going to make myself a, a available to, to just kind of open up to, to people who might want to um, share and, and, and do that. And I commit to doing that periodically and regularly. Um, and so forgive me for not having those the details fully figured out, but I wanted to at least put that out there to, to save the date for April 11th. It's a Monday in the evening. Um, if you'd like to, 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 you know, just get on briefly or, or, or and, and share some um, concerns or questions you might have, I, I'll be making myself available um, online then. So that's all I have. Hey, thank you. Uh, board member Giannis. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm thankful and grateful to be able to be at this board meeting via Zoom. Uh, I have a question, Agent. You just you just shared April 11th. I did, and that's inaccurate. Thank you, May 11th. Thank you so much. Monday, okay. May 11th. I appreciate that. Okay, just I was looking. I was like, wait. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriela. Okay, Gabriela. No problem. Um, I, I wanted to go ahead and also thank all the employees that. Uh, have been coming to work and uh, uh, doing uh, what you know what what's been asked the extra curricular activities that they've been asked to do other than their job. Um, we thank thee for everything and your commitment to this district, and for you showing up to work and really being there because it's all about the students. Um, and I, I really really appreciate you guys, um, and uh, for administration as well. Um, everything that you guys are doing behind the scenes. Um, it, it, this is not easy for anybody, but I know that together as a district, um, we're working together and administration, you guys are holding down the fort as long as uh, along with our employees. And I, I thank you for that. Graduation, I think it's, it's, a, topic, it's a topic that we need to start addressing. Um, what, what does that you know, look like? Uh, kind of what my colleague, uh, Board member Cruz Gonzalez said, um, can, can we, you know, talk about postponing it? Um, you know, let, let's reach out to the seniors and ask them what they would like to do. This is their year. And just like right now, when we just saw Jimena's video, um, you know what, their feelings need to be validated. And I, I, I can't even imagine right now being a senior and, and going through this and not being able to participate in it. In, in a graduation, you know, um, I, I have, uh, I've had certain people ask me, um, you know, do we order our cap and gown? Should we, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we as a board uh, do have a, a topic of conversation about this in the next week or two and be able to come up with an action plan to, to be able to, you know, bring forth the, um, what these seniors can expect. Um, and you know, bring them also, and invite them to to that meeting for them to be able to uh, to participate. And um, the next thing um, I want to do, I want to say, is I was able to participate in with Gladstone High School. Thank you to Miss uh, uh, Bullock for the invitation uh, to honor the 60 students that were honored by the teachers and the counselors. Um, it was really nice to hear. Um, and you know what, it, it wasn't so bad um, being on uh, Zoom and uh, being able to hear all these great things about this individual, uh, the individuals that they were uh, um, acknowledging and uh, congratulating. That was an honor for me to be there, so thank you. Um, I, I wanted to go ahead and uh, also congratulate uh, uh, the high schools that made it to the US News Report that speaks volume on how our high schools are doing. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. I wanna also thank Nutrition Services for the lunches. Um, 
that there's, you know, every day that they're there for the, for the, for the families. And one thing that I noticed that is new is the paper scan um, that many families can bring and they don't have to bring their kids anymore. So um, that's something new. Yay to whoever thought of that. I, I, I don't know. Um, but Mark, uh, whoever, th please tell them thank you. Uh, parents are really happy they don't have to bring their children. Um, it could, they could just go and it gets scanned and they are, they're able to get their lunches. Um, I wanted to go ahead also and uh, talk a, a little bit about, um, not, not today, but, but in the, this next meeting that we have, what is uh, something that uh, my colleague, uh, board member Shanelene Cruz uh, mentioned? I had actually about a week ago, I had emailed um, Linda, I emailed you with uh, looking at the potential calendar for the fall um, at the state level and at the national level. Uh, you know, what does that look like? Um, COVID V19 along with the flu season and if we can be proactive and looking at that. And um, one of the topics of conversation was um, starting school earlier, um, you know, possibly in July. Uh, so I, I would love to invite, you know, all of us to have a conversation about that. What does that look like? Um, something that we can, um, I know we can't predict the future, but at the same time, keeping in mind what uh, the health department is saying that this next uh, flu season will We'll have more, uh, it'll be round two of uh, COVID-19. So to, just to keep that in mind and how we can protect our students, um, I think it's really, really important um, uh, that we have a conversation about this and invite uh, Jorge. Uh, I don't know if it's the union that we need to speak to, but like I said, it's coming up from above that, um, that we have these conversations. So um, let's see here. Uh, and also too, I wanna to go ahead also, last thing, I wanna go ahead and touch on that five-year plan. I think it's important that we don't start in August talking about that. I think it's important that we start talking about this in the next week or two, again. And uh, Linda, I hope, please take note that it's really important that one of the things that we specifically asked for was for us to be able to engage the community to, to be part of this. And I expect, and I, recommend that we continue with that moving forward. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And Jerry, um, I have one other thing. Jerry, do you mind if I just, I forgot one thing? Oh, no problem, sure? go right ahead. Yeah. Sure, so, uh, so just one other thing I, that I want to request that we look into. So I know the state just got approved for, the, for pandemic EBT. And so my understanding is that we're able to access that without affecting the food that we actually provide our students. So I was hoping that we could look into it because that could just be another source of um, another source of food for our fat students families. Um, and I think because if they're on free and reduced, they, they get they can easily get access to that. So I just want to I just want to request that we look into that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. OK, um, I personally I just like to piggyback on what everybody else said. Um, so much work has been done with such relative smoothness, smoothness. I guess that's the best I can say. Um, our staff, our cabinet, and all everybody else involved. I mean, with our lunch pickups, I see posts on Facebook with our people posting it, and they're having a good time doing that. And it shows the community. I mean, imagine you're sitting there and you're with your kids, or you get away and you have this person full of sunshine greeting you, handing you your meal, it adds that extra something, community involvement to everybody. So I wanna compliment everybody on reaching out and you know, touching, not literally touching the community, but touching the community and letting them know that we're here for them. So, and everybody has done an excellent, excellent job. Thank you. Okay, so next we will move on to item 8.0, comments and reports by student board member. 8.1, comments and reports by the student board member, cabinet and superintendent. So student board member. Hello, um, I just wanted to comment and say that I've been enjoying and appreciating the time I get to spend connecting with my leadership class at school. Well, not at school, but through you know, meetings and emails. And it's just the fact that we've been able to reach out and stay connected to the student body. And 
as a whole, we're all learning how to lead in a different way. And I just think it's really awesome. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, who's next? Okay. Jorge, do you want to right here? Yes, good evening, um, Board of Education, Cabinet, um, staff and community. Uh, I want to uh, just echo the, the statements about our staff um, that have been just outstanding in many different ways. Um, our teachers, uh, I shared with principals earlier today that uh, who would have thought that working from home would require would be so so much work. Uh, and and um, really going the extra mile um, and really, uh, really the, the, the heart of the community is really um, I mean the beneficiary of this stuff so, uh, from I, I, I appreciate um, the, the frequent uh, board meetings that we're able to come together um, and um, thank you. Mark. All right. Um, so, well, you asked about the PEBT. Um, I wanted to be able to give you the, the info on that. Um, the, the PEBT will be coming to families in May um, automatically if the families are already part of CalFresh or Medi-Cal. Um, they will automatically receive it in the mail. So, can you can you please clarify what PEBT means for the people that are watching that don't know? Sure, sure. Um, Jillian had stated it earlier, but it's pandemic EBT. So everyone who's um, already on the EBT system, um, they will be getting a PEBT card, a pandemic EBT, um, and they should be starting to arrive on May 7th through the 22nd. If um, the family is not part of one of those groups, they can apply um, to, to be added. And we will communicate that out through our channels and um, be working with other organizations to help advertise that. Um, and they can get 350, I'm sorry, $365 um per child on on the card so it'll be able to help them with food and groceries and they can use that at a market right yeah food and yeah. food well it, it'll operate just like an ebt card oh okay so, so they can use it to get any type of food at, at any establishment that accepts ebt mm. would this 365 be um be weekly or um so I believe it is, it is monthly. So I, and I have another question, Mark. Yeah, I have a question, mm -hmm. Mark. So um, um, I think I appreciate the uh, assistance to somebody in the information, but I know that we, there are existing, um, there are existing methods to ensure that kids are cross enrolled in um, free and reduced lunch and CalFresh. But is there a way, I mean, I, I mean, I understand for both too, but is there a way that we can identify those students in our district that are not enrolled in those programs and do specific outreach to them to make sure that they know that they're eligible to do this as opposed to just doing like a, you know, a call out to everyone. Uh, and the reason I ask is because I, I, I fear as well that the same students that we're having the hardest time to reach are probably the same families that may not be enrolled in these programs. Okay, I'll check on the legality of using that list as a contact list. So I know there are some limits, but I will, if we, if we can do it, we'll definitely do it. And it would just add, it would be just great to be able to partner with like county, with the county health, health other people, like another partnership so that, I mean, so that may not be just us. Correct. Yeah. Um, for my other updates, uh, echo what many of our board members stated about the hard work that our staffs are, are doing. So um, making sure that our families continue to be fed. Um, and, you know, last time I provided an update, they were doing it in the pouring rain and now they're doing it in the blistering heat. Um, so it, I, it's, it's amazing the dedication our staff has and <clears throat> we're trying to do everything that we can to support them 
um, or, or putting up tents or, or looking at other options um, to make sure that we can keep our, our folks safe and, and um, protected. So I um, appreciate the ideas um, that folks have shared. So we, we came up or I came up with the, the QR code system to comply with the, the regulation that allowed us to serve um, families that, um, that weren't able to bring their kids to the school and um, be able to ensure that we were not providing meals to uh, folks that did not have kids or um, were, were going through the line multiple times. And so it was really a um, kind of a, a necessity piece. Um, so that way we could make sure that we were doing that. And we you know, used our creative minds to come up with an idea that would um, work and simplify. It, it also helps us to tally up numbers pretty quickly. Um, and that way we, we know where we are in the day. Um, Mark, can you please explain how does it work? Sure. Um, please. Like, in other words, they cannot go to Azusa and then go to Gladstone and get food again, or how, how does the system work? Sure. So um, the first time a, a parent comes in to the one of the four sites, um, they won't, won't have a card, obviously. So when they bring their students for the first time, we um, note how many kids that they have, and we tag that card with however many kids that is. So let's pretend it was three. Um, and then that parent leaves with their food for the day. The next time they come around, they will show us that QR code through the window and we can scan it from pretty far away. Um, and then we, we know that that card is worth um, now three meals. Um, and then if they were to attempt to go to another school site, we know that that card already showed up at, um, at, a, at, a, at a different school or the same school during the same day. And so that way we're able to keep track of, of how families are, are um, using the system. Um, so it, it has helped to expedite the lines. Um, so that way there's not as much um, conversation about how many kids are in the car. And it has, um, it has you know, helped our staff to not have to interact as much um, face to face with mm -hmm. with the families, so that way we make sure that both sides are are kept safe. But, but also, um, <clears throat> the students do not have to belong to AUSD, correct? It's just some correct, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, so yeah. and it doesn't have to be a student; it could be a newborn infant, um, zero to eighteen years 18. old. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, but it, again, our, our, it's not just nutrition services that's working. We have um, a large group of folks that are uh, making sure that we're, we're ready for next year, um, that are manning the phones to make sure that our families can communicate if they're having any issues. So it's really establishing a, a completely different style operation in a short time and our amazing staff has, has adapted quickly. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mark and Arturo. Good evening, board, um, staff and audience members. Um, I too wanna echo just a, a huge, tremendous uh, thank you and congratulations to, uh, to our staff, to our students, to our community. Um, it has just been um, amazing and heartwarming to see uh, the amount of leadership, the amount of commitment, uh, the amount of growth and learning um, that all of these entities uh, have displayed and have demonstrated uh, through this time. Um, and I just wanted to, again, show my thanks and my, and my gratitude uh, for that. Um, and then I just wanted to share a sneak peek. This is not in any way, shape or form a, a full picture uh, but just want to give you, uh, again, just a sneak peek of some of the outreach and some of the outcomes that have happened uh, from, our, from our outreach uh, to parents. Um, again, not a full picture, uh, but we will definitely keep you updated on this data. Um, 
this week, um, sorry, not this week, uh, as of today, uh, we, have, um, we have reached out to 188 families um, who originally had said uh, that they uh, were having issues uh, connecting. Uh, 28 of those families, uh, we still were not successful in connecting with. Um, but 17 of those families, we have been working with them uh, to connect them and we're pretty close to being successful with that. Uh, and the rest of the parents um, had already connected uh, one way uh, or the other. Uh, at the high school level, uh, led by, um, by Norma and her department and the, the amazing teams at the high schools, um, really reached out to our newcomer students. Uh, there are 71 in total. Um, of those 71, only eight uh, were not connecting uh, to uh, the distance learning. Um, and of those eight, uh, six of those uh, were because of devices uh, or uh, the internet. Uh, two of them had nothing to do with the device or the internet. Uh, it was just not knowing how to connect to the Google Classroom or to their teacher's uh, sites. And um, one uh, still have not been able to, to locate. So when we think about just in, in total right now, this is over 150, I'm sorry, over 250 uh, connections, uh, which right now 29 uh, you know, left messages, we're looking, we're trying to connect, uh, but everybody else is on their way to connecting to distance learning. Uh, so as we get more data, more robust data, again, we'll make sure that we put that in the Friday board packet and continue to communicate um, at board meetings as well. Thank you, Arturo. And um, like the, I think all of us, board members and cabinet members and our students, um, while we're in challenging times, what I think we realize is that we have so many people to thank. Um, so I also would like to, to thank the teachers, the, the classified staff who are feeding people, keeping our facilities in good shape, helping kids learn, making sure that they learn, instructional aides helping out, the principals who are working to coordinate all that and support their teachers and staff at their sites. Um, that work is never ending. And it, you know it's something that I think we can all be very, very proud of that um, we, really have been trying our best to live up to the promise of continuous learning, whether it's in school or through distance learning. Um, I'd also like to um, thank the city council. I hear that they voted last night to approve uh, a partnership with us to provide lawn science for our seniors. And it's something that we had already been talking about in our district, so we were excited about it. and very happy to have a, a token of our appreciation for our kids and let them know we're thinking of you, we care about you. Um, I'd also like to thank the, um, the high school students and teachers and principals who've been working together to get the input on graduation. We also took the very strong approach that this is something that should be student driven. We should listen to students' um, interests and their preferences and um, take that into account as we move forward so that the best, we can do our best job to um, help them have a recognition that they will remember and will be meaningful to them. So we are learning more about that later on in the week and continue to work on that. Um, we've also been working on the calendar. We the comments made by a board member, Arianas, and the um, calendar is something that the district works on in partnership with the unions. And so we are looking at a, a number of different varieties and um, possibilities but also being mindful that we have, to, we have to watch what the numbers are with COVID. We have to watch to see when is it, when it, will it be safe for our students to come back so that we don't put anybody at risk, um, but that we plan for some uncertainties that could happen when we, uh, after we do come back. So a lot of good planning and thought is going into that already. Um, I just wanna clarify real quick, just uh, to start off with, perhaps distance learning, and that's what I wrote in the email. Um, but just to be able to keep in mind that this next flu season is gonna be a little bit different. And yeah. yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so there are a lot of things that we have to have to take into consideration there. Um, and then finally, just to uh, point out the gentleman here in the cabinet, Arturo and his work on distance learning and reaching out to students and being very proactive so that we have a way of making sure we actually know that we're connecting with everybody who is, is in need of strength and support for connecting. 
Jorge and the work he, he will be doing with the calendar and bringing that through negotiations. And of course, Mark and the QR code. Um, you know, when we first heard from a few weeks ago, we heard from nutrition or the, the State Department of Education that the state had gotten a waiver to um, provide some flexibility in the nutrition services program while we're in this COVID-19. The big caveat was that you had to demonstrate that you were providing these foods with accountability so that you knew who you were providing the information, the, the food to. And um, I appreciate Mark, you know, stepping right up to the bat on that and coming up with a plan that is workable and, and um, recognizes that families certainly need support. And we, you know, we're delighted actually when the lines are, are full and we know that there's a lot of people being served, but we're also, I'm very proud that we have a way of doing it that helps everybody realize that um, we are being responsible with our um, support and services and funding. So thank you to all of them. Thank you. And one more time, Jimena, muchísimas gracias. That was wonderful. Your, your video was lovely. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to 9.0, report action of closed session matters. Student matter final settlement, uh, 9.1, student matter final settlement for Office of Administrative Hearing, case 2020040038. Student number 1921-24. And do I have a motion? I move to approve. Okay, moved. Okay, moved by board member Greer, seconded by uh, board member Arianas. And any discussion? Okay, let's vote. Okay, it passes 5-0, and now we will move on to 10.0, general functions, 10.1, 20, 21 through 2030, student enrollment projections and demographic studies report. And I'll invite Mark to share with us all the um, information that we received from the demographer that we hired to help us plan as part of this long-term planning that we are doing here. One of the um, items that came up right away is that we wanted to make sure that our questions <coughs> um, provided us a solid foundation for future decision-making. All right, can everyone see the screen? Yeah, yeah? okay. So this is the uh, agreement that we went out for to get 10 years worth of uh, projections and to see some of the um, demographics data come in for our area, our district boundaries. Um, and there is a full report that's, um, uh, I think, 80 pages long that's included in this agenda item. Um, but I've taken kind of the key pieces, um, uh, kind of the highlights. Of, of the data to show and then also compared it with um, what we were looking at prior. And so that way we could see the difference and, um, and make a decision as to where we wanna land as far as what we will estimate for our enrollment in the future. So as far as enrollment projections, um, you can see the green line, which was what our prior projections were before um, we went out for the study. Um, and that's, that's where we were projecting, um, which is under um, what Decision Insight is estimating, which obviously is a good thing, um, that there's hope that it won't be as low. Um, but even when we go 10 years out, um, you know, we're, we're somewhere around 600 kids um, different, right, than, mm -hmm. than what we were projecting before. Um, if you look at kind of the shape of the line, you can see that um, it, in 22-23, their curve right there, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but is... Um, 
it kind of flattens out for, for their projections. Um, and that, that is, you know, um, statistics for you. If, if you look at um, the rate, so they're, they're saying, well, we'll go on a percentage uh, loss and that, that would work. Um, when I was looking at it, my estimates were a little higher because it, it seemed like the percentages were growing and they have been growing. So some slight differences there. Um, when we zoom in on that, you can kind of see the numbers a little bit closer. So this is a truncated report. So we're only looking at from 5,000 to 8,000 to kind of separate those differences. And you can really see um, where you know, their projections kind of um, arc up in that 22, 23 year. Um, but you can see that enrollment will continue to decline. Um, and, 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 you know, significantly. Um, I'll stop there and see if there's any questions on the enrollment piece, as that's the, the biggest um, chunk of, of importance for planning. I saw one hand go up. Do you want me to unmute you? Yeah, I have, I have another. I have a hand up too. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. No, I haven't done it yet. Oh, no. okay. Okay. Um, I I'll, I'll go with Gabby first. I, I saw that hand, and then I see Adrian okay. and Sharon. Okay, Mark, I have a uh, question. So, you you right now you mentioned decision, uh, Mark. What? So what do you what do you mean how um, so the projection for the decision for oh, you didn't you, you didn't share what decision you weren't specific about it so we we use whatever number for enrollment that we choose um, based off of our projections to estimate how many kids will be enrolled in the district and that then estimates how much. ADA we will receive for that year. So if we estimate that you know, we have in 21, 22, 7,103 kids versus 6,902, then we would be estimating that we would have less revenue for that year. If we use um, decision insights number, then we would be estimating that we have more revenue. So, so where's, what is, what line is the one that, um, I, I mean, can you explain the lines? Because our, our prior projection, if we look at 2021, 22, uh, our prior projection was 6,902. The mm -hmm. moderate is 7,103. Right. And then the conservative. So what is the difference between the moderate and conservative? Um, I mean, the, the top one, the green one, is what, what uh, the district projected, but the actual, can, can you explain that, the moderate and conservative and what the difference is? Sure, so the, the prior projections are what we had said um, and we had shared with the board and um, on, a, on, on a few occasions based off of projections using uh, a weighted cohort average, okay? And so we're bringing in birth rate data and we're calculating it on our own. Um, we went out for a demographic study to see if we could get a more precise um, estimate or at least a second opinion. Um, and that was something the board requested. And that is come back with these red and orange uh, lines. So the, the red line is um, their estimate of what would be a conservative number for enrollment. Um, their moderate is what they're saying would be, um, you know, I guess more hopeful set of numbers. Okay. So their, their estimate is, they're saying is somewhere down the middle. They're, okay that is where their confidence interval is, is somewhere down the middle of that red and orange line. 
So we're looking in, in 10 years, uh, even five years, we're looking at a substantial uh, low of enrollment. Yeah. Yeah, even in two years, I mean, I think mm -hmm. 600, a 600 kid loss is pretty significant. Um, so that is the enrollment piece. I saw a few more hands, so I'll, I'll go with, um, Sheila, did you have a, a question? I put it down. Okay. And Adrian? Yeah, so a couple things. I think it's important to note. Um, so th this this study that, that was done by the demographer, um, looking a cu couple things that are, that are interesting. Looking at the, the larger report on page four, at the bottom of page four, it talks about summary of average age findings. Um, and so it says the average age trend chart shows both history and projection of the um, no, I'm looking at the wrong place, excuse me. This is the, um, the bottom of page five. Um, if the percentage of population under 20 is declining as a percentage of the total, it is likely that the community will see an increase, increase in the more senior age population possibly due to a decline in birth rates. Um, it also says that in the study area, children 17 of age and younger are declining as a percentage of the total population. Considering the other end of the phases of life, adults 55 years of age and older are increasing as a percentage of total population. So something that was interesting, and it speaks to things that we've talked about um, in previous meetings, that if we look, the, the population appears to be increasing overall, but it but it's showing that um, if, if you begin to segment different um, age ranges, that we can see where the increases are happening and where the decreases are happening. And so this is, is showing that the decrease is happening within um, you know, the, the, the group, the age ranges that we primarily work with. Um, scrolling down a little bit further though, on the next page, there is one exception. It does say that ages five to nine, that there is an increase looking from 20, 2010 to, um, to 2024. Can you, so can you speak to that? And does, does that communicate that there will then be a resurgence that we're expecting a, a resurgence to begin at that time or the demographers are, dem the demographers are, are, are communicating this? Uh, if I remember, and I, I'll see if I can share that screen. Um, so you're, you're saying on page four. Uh, I was wrong. It's the bottom of page five is the conclusion that I read. And, but then on page six, there is a, a, um, a table that shows is a, that shows ages five to nine, okay. that there's an increase. Let me share this screen so people can see. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. Um, so this this is the chart that he's that he's uh, speaking of, and so it is showing that um, the difference and that there would be a very slight increase of early elementary, and then a slight, almost you know, inverse of elementary. Uh, middle school and then a flat um, high school. Um, is that is that's what you're talking about? That so I am talking about that, and I'm trying to understand how that how this um, well one if there if this means that by the time we get around to this age there will be an up begin to be an uptick in numbers, and then two trying to understand with these slight variations of a plus a percent and a, and a negative percent how that amounts to some of the substantial um, decline in enrollment that we see across. Um, those years. Yeah, I mean, it, it is such a slight increase. I don't imagine that it would amount in, especially I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word res, resurgence um, because it is a 1% increase. Um, but it, it would be interesting because if you kind of look at the facts behind this, right? So what would that be based on um, in 2024, um, we have the birth rate data and the birth rate data does not show in the last set of data that we, that we have any increase in birth. Um, so it would, be, it would be interesting to see where that 1% came from. 
Uh, so I, I would definitely not say there's going to be a re resurgence of enrollment off of that. All right. Um, so going to the next slide, Adrian mentioned this, but this shows um, our population shift. Um, and I thought it was an interesting graph from the study. Oh, shoot, you guys cannot see that. Um, I believe you can see it now. So it it shows. Excuse me, Mark. What what is yeah. that page, please? This is in the PowerPoint, and it should be like page four. So that's one, two, three, and four. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so this chart shows the change in the population within our boundaries, um, and this is looking across across the lines. It's not just looking at kids that are enrolled in the district, obviously, um, with this age 65, but it shows a slight decrease from zero to four, 10 years from now. Um, and this would be, you know, of the population, um, a decrease in five to seven, a decrease in 18 to 24, and then a pretty significant, um, you know, 2% here, and then you see where those numbers are going. So the numbers of, of folks are going in that 65 and older, which is something that we've talked about um, at several board meetings that the San Gabriel Valley and, and it, um, is an aging population and that um, you know, folks love the area and, and, they, and they stay. Um, which doesn't turn over housing for new families to move in, um, which shows that kind of shift in population to being um, in an older bracket um, and definitely not school age. On the next chart, um, this is a, another kind of interesting fact. It doesn't really affect our funding or anything like that. Um, but there was a slight increase in, and even though this bar looks big, I just, I do want to point out it's only 1.25% um, increase in the Asian population and a decrease in the white and Hispanic um, population by, you know, less than a percent. So you see uh, an increase of, um, of Asian Pacific Islanders and decrease of others in the area. And I think um, probably attributed to you know, the Rosedale development that has different demographics than um, further down in, into the city. And I will then open it up for any, any questions. So one, one, I mean, it's kind of continuation of the last question I had. So I may have done my math incorrectly. So, so please chime in and, and correct me if, if I've done it wrong, but it's, it's looking like if we look at the conservative estimate that they, or, or the moderate estimate that they have for us, um, it, it looks like there's somewhere around the, the, the likes of a 20% decline in enrollment that we would be seeing over the course of, you know, total over the, from here to 10 years into the future. Um, but, but we're seeing a 1%, what's, what's the actual numbers? Um, we're seeing a 0.9 and a, and a negative 1.2%. We're seeing that decrease. How does that one, roughly 1% 1 decrease amount to a 20% decrease in our student population and students in our district? So it, it has a, a bunch of factors. So if you're we talking about, you're talking about this 1%? Correct. Um, well, not the 0 0.1, but across the board. So if we see the 0.9 and the 1.2%, that's, I mean, it's about 1% across the board for those two age groups. Okay. So this is, 
yeah, so this is um, a great a great question. Why is our enrollment declining further? Um, and and this is where the two worlds meet. So we have the demographics um, which show you know how folks are coming in and out, but um, projections are primarily based off of past. Um, and so the past is is what predicts this future. And so because we've lost um, you know larger percentages in the last few years, those numbers are are weighing heavy in the projections that they're putting into this. So I mean, I, I still wonder then are there is there in essence, 19% of decline enrollment that is not accounted for. I mean, I, that's probably not fair to say entirely, but but roughly. So I see where 1% comes from, but where, but where does the other the other 19 to make up that roughly 20%? And we don't uh, we don't know. Yeah, we don't we don't know from their study, but it um, it is a question that I could go back with and and see if there's um, some answer that they would provide. As yeah, that'd be helpful. To that'd definitely be helpful. Where they see those kids going? That's a that's a good question to ask. Okay, um, okay. Gabrielle. Yeah, just um, just I just want to make sure that when you ask that question, that we're um, able to get that answer as well. Uh, could you please keep us updated on that and include it in the Friday report? Definitely. Thank you. All right. Any more uh, questions? All right. So we will move on to item 10.2, capital facilities projects update. So oh, here we are. All right. Hold on one quick second. Uh, And, and can, can Linda, would you, would you mind opening up and, and sharing, even before we get into sharing out of information, maybe clarifying some of the things that um, we discussed earlier, um, earlier in the day? Mm -hmm. uh, you're muted. Thank you, um, Adrian. Um, one of the things that the board has asked us to do as a, as a district is to help plan long-term where might we be and what should we be considering? And that led to the request to provide the board a report in uh, basically in September, uh, which is called the five-year plan or the five-year report. And as part of preparing that, um, a couple of things have already started to take place. The first one is this demographic report that is, is cr it's critical to have that. Um, but the other thing to look at is um, the information that has been shared with the board in terms of what are the possibilities of, of how we might look at our facilities, what, what could work for us, what might not work for us, um, recognizing that no decisions have been made and that certainly there's a lot of room for discussion um, and engagement with the public around this, as well as whatever reports can be included in it. Um, from the point of view of if, if we, for example, were ever to decide that we want a 712 high school, we can look at these projections and there's more detailed reports that, that can tell you a little bit about what's the size of the high school population over the next couple of years. You can look at them and see that in order to do that within you know, the next, it's probably not feasible to do that within the next five years, but maybe long-term. If you wanted to go ahead and do it, then we would probably have to put some extra buildings on a campus. Or if we were going to do something with elementary schools, there are some schools that need some support with extra buildings and some that don't. So the question that is really um, preparing us as a, as a board to think about, we don't know what direction we're gonna go in, but we do know that some of these directions will require some facilities, some, some um, buildings. The cost of a, a real you know, stick and mortar buildings is prohibitive. So we've been looking at different kinds of portables, ranging for as, for example, things that we currently have on some of our campuses, 
whether it might be the portables over at Mountain View or something that we might have at Magnolia or Ellington as examples of what, what's out there that we could consider and to ask ourselves, what do we want to do as a district? No decision has been made about where we're gonna do it or when we're gonna do it or how we're gonna do it. But in order to make any kind of moves later down the line, we have to have a sense of what direction we're headed in, which, which path are we gonna go on? And so that's the point of this. And I apologize that the, the architect started this quite a while ago. It was late in getting to us, which is why it was late getting onto the agenda. But, um, and they began when, at the time when we, uh, at the time, good six months ago or so, the um, conversation was about, well, what would it look like? What would it take if you wanted to do a K-8? It's just as a hypothetical. There, when it comes down to real planning, they will have to do the same kind of thing for specific, specific other configurations. But this right now is just to, to answer the question of, or to kind of understand the question really, what, what could, what types of portables are there out there? And what should we think about? And they've, they've included some costs of, you know, like if you need a few, you know, this many portables, this is what it's gonna cost you just to give the board um, an idea of what the costs are. And Mark also has some information that we received just recently from them about how do those costs compare to what the cost would be of renovating uh, or modernizing some of the schools um, that we have been thinking we would uh, modernize until we ran into this um, challenge with the decline in enrollment. So Mark will walk you through some of these things, um, answer whatever questions you have, and he'll share with you some of the cost figures for a comparison basis to help kind of guide our thinking and our, our processing of the information. And as well, you if you have questions, we can continue to research it some more. Yeah, I, I do. I do want to be careful about just hopping right into it, um, be, because there, you know, so there because of the confusion that that did exist here with this, and so I mean, do we? I know I see. Do others see how this is? I mean, how um, retrospectively the way that this came out is not as clear as it as it could have been, whether it's via the description of this item, um, and also um, the title being possible K eight K eight expansions. Um, so so I. I'm again. I want to. I, I completely understand the, the couple of people who came on and, and uh, uh, Andrew and Meg who came on and shared how the the concern that this that this came. Out, I, I completely understand that because um, it, it it isn't clear. And so I I want to be careful to just not pivot and and move right into the presentation without um, taking a moment to to look at the process to this to and then determine if this is indeed something that we should receive as an info item at this time. Um, I think that's a good point. The other thing that, um, that I uh, failed to mention right now is we were prepared to share with you verbally some updates on what's happening with the fields, what's happening with bleachers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Mark is prepared to go over that with you. Can I ask a question, um, Jerry? Yes, please. Oh, oh OK, thank you. So. Um, I actually would like to see other options other than just this option when we talk about it. Um, and I would also, I'm sure some of these expansions will have to do with school bond money. And I know I've asked several times with the school bond pyramid that we originally had in place. I like to see what projects have been done on this pyramid, what projects have not been done. So for my own self to see, um, I mean, do we want to spend the, the money out of the school bond for something like this or K-12 or, or whatever? I, I really would like to see um, what money we used already through this and, and what projects have been done and what projects have not been done. That's, I'd like to recommend that, please. Certainly. So I... I, I, I think... Um, Gabriella had a question for me. Okay, Gabby. Gabriella. Okay. Oh, yeah, can you can you guys hear me? Yeah. I, I I am gonna recommend that um it, it, it's this PDF is very misleading. Um it, it's it's we're talking about um we just had a presentation of, of low enrollment. I think it's important, you know, you, and then we, we, you present this possible K-8 expansion. Just the title alone is very misleading. I think it's really important that, you, that um, Linda, cabinet, that it's, it's important that I agree with my colleague, uh, 
board member Yolanda Pena, that it's important that we also know what has been done and what still needs to be done in uh, the facilities from Measure K. And we need to reconsider that and possibly, uh, you know, uh, take a look at that. Looking at the projections of the declining enrollment for the next five to 10 years, it is imperative, imperative that we just do not get a possible K through eight expansion in a PDF that we do the research, like you just said, Linda, you know, what, what does it look like to go to the possibility of going to a one, one high school? What does it look like um, to have a seven through 12, um, you know, uh, option? It is important that we get that documentation for us to be able to move forward with our decisions, especially because it involves Measure K bond money, which is the taxpayer's money. It is important that we are not being misled, that we do not mislead our, you know, the, the, within the meetings, um, that one thing is said and then one thing is presented. Um, at this point right now, I, I, I'm really confused and I, 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 I'm not okay with this. And um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that uh, I, I would like for the demo, uh, I know that it's projections from what he, um, the study that he collected the data, but I think it's really important too that we, we wait for the enrollment of the fall, what the actual numbers look like. Because after this, you know, after this uh, stay home order, we don't know how many kids are gonna be coming back to public school. Some of the kids are moving into other options because of options are more favorable for them. So I think it's really, really important we take that into account and that we talk about this as soon as possible. And we do get those demographics of how many kids are actually coming back to a Sousa Unified School District in the fall. So I'm gonna recommend that we, we get that. And this conversation is not gonna be just, just one information item and for us to be able to vote on this, this has to be a continuous you know, a conversation that we have. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I understand the whole problem with it saying one thing in the K-8 expansion studies. I mean, that is apples and oranges. I understand that that was, we were going to get information to uh, guide staff into what to look into if we ever go to portables. I understand that that's what that was all about, but yes, as far as how it was put here, we're supposed to be getting um, parking lots and bleachers and fields and project closeouts. And I also agree that if we could get some kind of running tally on what we've done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And would you, uh, my question right now is actually, would you like Mark to talk about some of these other items that you're asking about the, the adult ed parking lot, the Zusa High and Gladstone High School uh, bleachers and fields? And with, with, I'd say without having something physical to, um, to see, like no. just, just it being shared verbally yeah. is, is, is challenging. Um, I, um, so I would prefer, I, I think at this point, um, to, I would still like this update, but it doesn't look like we're ready to, re to, to, have the update shared or for us to receive the update um and then as far as the the for the for what the agenda actually says and then as far as the content of this i i really request i i'd, I'd like to suggest that we um make some adjustments to this presentation even if it's changing the title and and and, and making some other adjustments so that when we receive yeah. it and and agendize it accurately so that when we receive the information it truly is about um, the, the, the options of, and costs of, of relocating versus purchasing new, um, uh, portables. Mm -hmm. I think that, that that would be helpful. And something else that I want to just make sure that I communicate extremely clearly to anybody who saw this and thought that this somehow indicates that decisions were indeed made. And, 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 and now this is, you know, and letting everyone in on the, on the process that is absolutely not the case. Um, we, we definitely, we have, um, September set as a deadline. I want to say at our last strategic planning session before we um, split for um, uh, with social distancing, we, we looking at the timeline and whatnot, that, that timeline was moved to September 15th, I believe, I believe it was. There's a board meeting on that day. 
um, which is the, 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 the day that we'll have that final thing shared out. But the only way that that gets shared out is, is by us having series of meetings over the, starting you know, now and understanding that this last month things happened that we were out of our control, but starting now that we have these meetings scheduled that allow for community input, for people to speak into their thoughts. Um, I want to hear from what are uh, teachers thinking, what are what are families thinking? What are our, two, our, our uh, team, you know, students thinking? So that we can have a robust input, so that by the time we arrive at whatever is uh, uh, comes to us at at um, on the fifteenth of September, there isn't some sort of unveiling where everyone finds out on that day, but that there has been a conversation that has been happening that people have been invited to participate in. So there should be no surprises um, on that on that date of the of, of the fifteenth. And I'm sure there will be um, options that are eliminated along the way, but as of right now. There have not been any options that have been eliminated. All, all options are still on the table, um, and and all you know, and, and we're we are welcoming information, insight, and data on each and every option in order to to make a final decision um, after you know the discussion happens later. And uh, discussion happens now, and the decision final decision happens later um, this fall. Okay, so across, I also, I also would like to. Um... Actually, regarding the bleachers and the fields, I would like to have a hard copy or a PowerPoint um, for you just to throw numbers at me and me just visualize it in my head. It's yeah. I just rather see something like that. I, I think that it also would be transparent to um, to the staff and the community because school bond money, it's 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 community funding. It's taxes our taxpayers, but it's also our staff that has to work there. I don't work there, but right. they work there. So I think that. I would like to see it, but I'm sure I like them to also see what, what we're talking about. So can we bring this back at a dent? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, can we kind of make all these little adjustments and bring this back? Certainly. Certainly. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Linda. I agree. All right. So how does everybody else feel? Yeah. Okay. All right. We got heads nodding. All righty, so at this point, we'll just go ahead and move on to item 10.3, communications update. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. All right, give me just a second to start my screen share here. Uh, tell me when you guys can see it. Is there it we go. All right, awesome. Believe it or not, this is the first time I've done a screen share on Zoom. So this has oh. been exciting for me. Where uh -huh. are you? I want to, we want to see your face. Oh, you can't see my face? Uh, well, I can't. Can somebody see her? No. Uh, no, we can't the see cam Camera's off. <laughs> Put the hey. face to the PowerPoint. Okay, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on two different screens here, so. <laughs> and and Lika, the presentation, at least on my end, looks a bit misaligned. Is it is it just me, or is that others as well? Um, looks fine. Did that help? Okay, I only yeah. see the top upper right. Left so Lika, instead of sharing your screens, share the application. Um, give me just a second. Then let's end the screen share. And let's share, let's try this. Is that any better? No, but you can, I can okay. look at it. I can look at it over here on my screen. <laughs> you can blow it, it up. It looks fine to me. It looks right. fine to me. Okay. Yeah, it looks fine to me too. Sure. All right, sorry guys. Um, so, okay, there we are. And let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger for you guys. All right, if it stops sharing at any time, um, let me know. I've had that issue a couple of times before on Google Meet. So just wave at me or, or shout at me and I'll, I'll reshare if I need to. Um, it's really nice to see you guys. It's nice to see your faces. It's been a while since I've seen some of you guys. Um, I hope you're all well and safe uh, during this crazy time that we're, that we're living in. Um, and thank you for allowing me the time to give um, a brief communications update to you guys. I know this has been um, in the works for a while. So I'm glad that we finally have the opportunity tonight to, to do it in this um, unique way. So I want to be cognizant of a couple of things here. Um, this is a this is a unique way for us to give and receive presentations. It's a very different dynamic 
um, than an in-person presentation where there's the ability to have a lot more interaction and there's um, the ability for me to read your faces better to know whether or not I'm answering the questions that you guys have. Um, so I'm going to do my best to um, answer some of the questions that I've received from you guys to, to hit some highlights. And then um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have at the end. And then if at any point further information is needed, um, I'm happy to come back to you guys with that at a later time or include it in a Friday um, board packet, um, whatever it is that uh, would be your preference would be fine with me. Um, and then I also want to point out that this communication communications update, except for the slide that is primarily on COVID-19, um, is talking about communications pre-COVID-19, so pre-pandemic, um, all of the things that we were working on and, and implementing and doing um, for this. So the, the first time that I came before the board um, to introduce our communications plan, um, I talked about how I relate everything in my life to running because I'm a runner. Um, so as I present this to you guys again, I'm very cognizant of the fact as well that um, we are we are in a, a marathon and not a sprint when it comes to communications as a district. Um, I have been in this position for about a year and a half now, um, and we have had to, um, all of us as a district, as a community, parents, students, um, you know, board members, cabinet, we've all had to um, retrain and rethink and reimagine the ways that we are communicating. So in essence, um, even though my position has existed within the district before, it looked very different than um, it does now. So a year and a half ago, we cleared the slate and, and we're starting, we started again. Um, and I'm, I'm happy tonight to just go, kind of go over some updates of, of where we're at with this. Um, I want to start out by highlighting some of our successes. Uh, I think it's important that we um, just take a moment, especially during this time when, you know, we're getting so much bad news that we take a moment to look at um, some of the, the things that we have to be proud of together. So we'll look at some success stories. Um, we'll go over some communications methods and frequency, uh, frequency of communication, which is um, a request that I'd received from um, board member Roger Despena. Um, we'll go over some goals and updates, which was a request from board member Cruz Gonzalez. Um, we'll talk about COVID-19 a little bit and then just talk about some plans um, moving forward and how we're gonna move forward and executing, um, I'm continuing to execute on, on some of our goals. Um, so again, just taking a look at some of our um, successes, we have had for a small district, a lot of local and um, national media exposure, which we can be um, really, really proud of. Um, one of the reasons why I wanna highlight these things in particular, so you can still see my screen, um, I highlighted the PBS Inside um, California Education episode that we had, our, our um, college board commercial, our Fox 11 school standout spot that was on Good Morning America and Channel 11, um, and then our Spectrum News feature. Uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted to point these things out specifically, these are not all of the media exposures that we've had throughout this past year and a half. Um, but the reason why I wanna highlight these is because these are outside of our normal circle of local news partners. Um, we have some great local news partners that we work with that are always willing um, to share our successes. Um, but I also think that's important that we um, begin to and continue to reach outside of our normal bubble because there are a lot of awesome things that are going on um, within our district that should be recognized um, at a state level and at a national level. So um, I'm, I'm happy that we've had these successes and you know we had been working on a couple of um, more surprises pre-COVID-19, um, whether or not those will pan out. Once we go back to brick and mortar, um, I'm not quite sure because everybody's going to have to change operations, but we're hopeful that we can um, continue with not only um, you know, getting local media exposure, but also national media exposure um, because our students and our staff um, deserve to be recognized on, on that level. Um, so those are just some of the highlights um, from the things that I mentioned. All of these things are available are, and were available, um, you know, on our Facebook, on our social media. Um, we sent them out, we sent links out in um, tweets and in text messages to parents um, so that people can can celebrate with us uh, these successes that we have because any success that we have is, is a success that involves um, more than one more than one person and more than one party and that's one of the things that I love about this position is it's not just one person who's making this happen I'm the one who gets to shout it from the rooftops um, but we have dedicated teachers and, and staff and students who are making all of these awesome things happen um, let's go to the next slide here 
So we're just going to review really quickly um, the types of communications methods that we use. Um, so for us, social media includes Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we use Peach Jar for e-flyer delivery. Um, and then we refer a lot to our Blackboard system. And I've come to the realization that some people um, may actually not know that Blackboard includes a couple of different components. So within Blackboard, um, we have our all call system, um, our mass text message system, and then our parent email system. So the Blackboard parent email system works with the same email addresses that PeachJar works from, but it's a separate system from PeachJar. So we have Blackboard parent email and then um, PeachJar email system. Uh, and then Blackboard also includes push notifications to our district app. Um, and then we have a YouTube channel as well. So, and then all, all of these things that I just mentioned are, are available. Um, and we have the AULIFT website, can't forget about that. Um, all, all of these things that I just mentioned are accessible through the AOSD app. So the app is um, one of my, my favorite tools for communication because for a parent, it's easy for a parent to just go there. You can see everything all in one place. Um, if your child is enrolled in more than one school, you can subscribe to different schools so that you're not missing everything. And, and every email, every text message, every push notification, um, every social media post is at your fingertips through the AOSD app. Um, we have recently added a couple of things to the app. Um, the app refreshes at midnight, so any updates that I'm able to take um, effect at midnight. Um, so if it's not already there tonight at midnight, um, there's a new section on the app that links to the, dist the distance learning website for the district. Um, so that parents, you know, if they have any questions, it's just, it's just another way for them to access the, dist the distance learning um, materials. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is just a reminder of, of how we have divided our audience. We have two broad groups. We have our internal and our external group. So our internal group um, includes all AUSD staff members, then also includes um, AUSD students. Um, and when we when we say AUSD students, we also have adult ed. And I know sometimes they tend to be um, left out or, or not mentioned, but that group I also include as students with our internal our internal audience. Our external audience, again, two primary groups. Um, we have parents and um, community members as one of the groups, and then businesses and stakeholders, um, including local um, local community partners such as Homework House, My Third Place, um, organizations like that in our, our external our external groups. Um, this next slide just delves a little bit into our communication um, frequency. So again, I know I see you guys squinting at your screens. I know this might be hard to, to see um, in this way. So I will include this in the Friday board packet so you guys can, can take a look at it and then um, ask any questions that you um, might have. But this chart was made to just help explain the communications method that we use um, and then the frequency that, that we use each, um, each method. Uh, so when it comes down to frequency, I think it's important to note that there is always room for, for flexibility, especially in the case of an emergency where we need to operate outside of normal communication patterns. So our, our staff email update, um, our goal is to send email updates to staff members uh, once per week. One of, the, one of the issues that we had encountered before was staff members saying, we receive you know, 25 emails from 25 different departments and it's so hard to, to find everything within our um, inboxes is, is a case of email overload. So we have moved to a once a week consolidated update where any department, um, anybody who has an announcement to make can submit that um, to the communications office and it can go in the Monday update. But that doesn't mean that if something important comes up um, you know, and it's not in the Monday update that we're not gonna you know, send it out in a timely fashion that we're gonna hold it um, it's just to hopefully ease up on some of the email overload that, that people were experiencing. Um, so again, I'm happy to include this chart in, um, in a Friday board packet so that you guys can take a look at it a little bit more um, clearly and, and uh, ask any questions you may have. Um, so to get kind of into the, the meat of things, um, I want to delve into um, our goals and then updates on, on those goals just, just a little bit. Um, so we have our first goal that's here on the screen was employee communication. Um, our objective there was to establish an effective employee communications plan to improve internal communication and employee in engagement. And so again, I, I want to um, emphasize that what I'm talking about here tonight is not all encompassing. These are the things that um, I have, you know, pulled out after some discussions, um, you know, with colleagues that, that I think are 
important things that we highlight. So within um, the, the objective or the goal of establishing an effective employee communications plan to improve internal communication and employee engagement, um, we have implemented a Monday announcement newsletter to all staff, which cuts down, as I mentioned, on the number of all staff emails um, sent. That email newsletter is called AUSD in Focus. Um, and from my understanding, you guys are on the all staff email, so you guys should receive those. I know we've had a couple of problems with the all staff. Um, Yolanda's is not in your head. <laughs> she yes. Some of the issues. Uh, we've had a couple of issues with with the distribution list, so I'm actively working on trying to figure out what what those are. Um, but AOST in focus is something that you guys should be getting as well. And if you have not been receiving them, again, this is pre COVID nineteen. Um, please let me know, and I'm happy to to make sure that you are on that list. Um, one of the other things that we did that I think was a big win for us was we reintroduced the tip line that AUSD had. And the tip line can be utilized by AUSD staff, students, by community members um, to submit uh, anything. It could be um, a tip on bullying. It could be a tip on vandalism. Um, it could be a concern that they want to share anonymously. Um, and, and they have the choice. People who are submitting tips have a choice to be anonymous. Um, or if they would like a response, they can include their, their contact information. Um, we have we, we have rolled it out also within the app. There are posters made um, that were sent to school sites. It was introduced to students. Um, and we've had some great success in receiving tips and being able to address some pretty major um, concerns with both students and staff, um, even, even things that people may think are unimportant. We had a neighbor report through the tip line um, that sprinklers were running overnight. And since we're not generally on campuses overnight, you know, we weren't aware and we didn't know that every night at you know, 1 a.m. our sprinklers were turning on. Um, so things things like that, um, the reintroduction of the tip line, I think, has been um, a great success, and I'm looking forward to continuing to utilize it, um, especially among our students, um, as a way that they can report concerns um, either about you know somebody's mental health or request help if they don't if they are afraid to go to somebody um, face to face, they can submit a request for help through the tip line. Um, those come to me directly and also to a couple of um, people on cabinet. Uh, and we, we address those as, as they come in as a priority. Um, and then one of the other things that we've done is we've developed a system of social media and web content managers at each site. And we provided training and continue to, continue to provide ongoing um, training support and management um, for web and social media platforms. So this one was a, a big one for me um, because again, with, with the number of sites that we have, with the number of departments um, that we have, um, I didn't want to miss an opportunity to share important information with, with any audience. And so it's important that information gets out that not, not only comes from the communications office or comes from the district office, but that it comes from the site level, um, that principals can share successes, that teachers can submit things to principals to be shared on their Facebook, on their website, um, on their YouTube channel if they choose to have one. Um, and the one of one of the challenges that we face in that is that not everybody is savvy with you know websites or with um, social media and so an important thing for for me was to make sure that our principals feel supported and that our, our directors feel supported as they're learning to engage with these new pieces of technology i'm not saying that our system is is perfect and i know that sometimes you know, posting on social media for some can just seem like, oh my gosh, this is just a another thing that we have to do. Um, but our community finds so much value in seeing pictures of their students and hearing updates, not just from the district level, but from the site level. So the system that we have implemented so far has um, worked out really, really well. I I'm proud of the way everybody has jumped in um, to embrace a new skill and has been um, patient and willing to, to, you know, learn something and and make something work that they maybe weren't comfortable with um, beforehand. So it, again, like I mentioned, um, this communications for the district is a, a partnership effort. It requires partners at all levels. Um, and I have been um, just so encouraged by the way people are willing um, to partner with us in, in this and sharing successes and, and struggling through some of the questions that we have as a district. Uh, moving forward under um, employee communications um, and internal communication and employee engagement. Um, we would like to create um, an insert and some key messaging and resources for new hires. So one of the pieces of feedback that we have heard from the employee side is, um, you know, how is it that we, how is it that we can learn the culture of the district? You know, we, we, we come into 
a new job and we're, we're learning the skills that we need to manage our new job, but how is it that we can partner in sharing successes and how is it that we can help communicate um, the goals of the district and the things that are important to the district. So I think that's something that we can um, move to include in, in an onboarding process um, that we can work with HR on moving forward. Um, and then also um, board member Arianis at one point has suggested um, including local elected officials on a mailing list of AUSD um, publications. So our current mailing list generally only hits the city of Azusa. And so I think there's value in making sure that we're expanding that mailing list um, to share our are to share our successes with local elected officials, even if they are a little bit kind of on the on the outskirts of, of our city limits. Um, and then also seeking certificates of congratulations and support from um, local officials when appropriate. Um, they have been really uh, excited to share in our in our joys and our successes. And it's just another way for us to kind of put AUSD on the map um, when we reach out to our, our local elected officials. Um, with some of the things that we are doing and some of the things that we are accomplishing. Um, moving on to the second goal, um, develop and maintain positive collaborative relationships with stakeholders to strengthen support for the Azusa Unified School District. Uh, and again, I, I want to em emphasize that this is not something that only I have been engaged in. This is um, an effort that involves all of you guys as you're out in the community interacting. This is something that involves all of our teachers, all of our students, all of our, all of our staff members, um, who live within the city, who work with, you know, who obviously work within the city, um, and who have connections with with our partners. Um, some progress in that area is we've created an active presence in the community via attendance and participation at events, meetings, and community forums. And I'm I'm not saying that this was not something that was occurring um, before I came to the district, but I think we have a more robust presence now, and we are more organized about the way um, we are handling these things. Um, for the most part, gone are the days of you know us showing up at an event and saying, "Oh, we didn't know our band was playing here. Oh, we didn't know you know the mariachis were were um, asked to perform at, at this event." Um, and again, that really speaks to the partnership of principals and teachers and directors reaching out to us to say, "Hey, we have this thing going on. Are you going to be there, or can you come take photos?" Um, and then of making making sure that our um, local community partners know who to reach out to if they need somebody for a committee or if they have a question and want district um, involvement. Uh, there, there had previously been um, no centralized system or places for a place, uh, or place for questions like that to go. Um, and now that we have a communications office, um, you know those those requests can come through us, and then we can filter them out to the the person or the people who are best to fit that role within the community. Um, we've also used social media as a tool to gauge parental um, parental and community concerns, um, track trends. Uh, and, and track trends. So I'm sure uh, most of you guys are aware that um, Azusa has some um, pretty robust Facebook forums. Um, and so those have been a good way for us to maybe see concerns that people um, are afraid of expressing to us directly or maybe a little bit apprehensive um, of you know speaking to somebody or maybe they just don't know how to reach out or who to reach out to. Um, so we, we've been actively monitoring um, different forums and, and different community groups to hear concerns and then make adjustments accordingly. Um, and those things have been just another helpful tool in our tool belt as we work to make sure that we are, are engaging our community and that we are meeting them um, where they are at and not asking them to rise to wherever it is that we are at. Um, we have built and maintained a regular meeting schedule with community leaders such as the city manager, the chief of police, um, APU community relations, um, and homework house staff. Um, that's not a comprehensive list, and I, I would hope that that list would continue to grow, that we would continue to have regular meetings with our partners um, who, who do a lot for us and that, and that we can continue to find ways to re reciprocate um, their, their effort. I have a question. Yes. Uh, yes, going back to uh, district support and maintaining those collaborative relationships, one of the things that I, that I did not hear right now, uh, mm -hmm. but by the way, I, I I really appreciate uh, your uh, presence on Facebook and Twitter and Snap, uh, not Snapchat. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> no, um, the uh, Instagram, that's what it's called. Yeah. Instagram, I really appreciate that and how you respond uh, back to questions that, um, you know, people have and stuff. I really appreciate that. But one thing that I, I did not hear you talk about right now um, is parks and recreation. Um, mm -hmm. our city parks and recreation. And um, one of the things that um, 
I know that they they've had is uh, uh, you know trying to get on the peach jar. Uh, th- there's uh, it, they've had a really hard time to mm-hmm. to try to get that. And so one of the things that they had offered um, I know before was you know uh, we'll go ahead and continue doing the flyers. Uh, so a uh, unified. You don't need to pay for them. We will still pay for them just long as it's physical. Um, and the district had said no. So can, can we think of a, uh, you know, an idea of how we can assist these programs because these programs through parks and recreation, the city, uh, it benefits our students. Um, you know, it, it makes, makes them, um, some of them are on our campuses and um, they, they're not, so I've heard some of the parents say, oh, well, I, I didn't know about this or um, I, you know, I, I didn't know we didn't get the flyer like we usually do. So um, could you so, please share how we can go ahead and collaborate with Parks and Recreation with the city yeah. in that aspect? Yeah, so I, I actually have a really good relationship with Mickey and we we worked through um, some of the, the issues that they were having with accessing Peach Jar. Um, so one of the things that we figured out was the, they had an account through Peach Jar, but it was set up incorrectly. So when they were sending flyers, they were actually not connecting with our schools. They were connecting somewhere else. Um, so one of the one of the misconceptions too about Peach Jar is that community organizations have to pay to advertise, um, and that is not necessarily true. So we worked out a deal with Peach Jar for our account where we are given a certain number of credits, and credits are what allow community organizations to submit flyers. So with like the Azusa City Library, um, with uh, Homework House, uh, with, um, I I know I spoke to um, Adrian's wife about um, my third place. I'm not not clear on whether or not they got their account up and running yet. But with all of these community partners, they have free accounts that we put credits on and that allows them to submit their flyers. So with Parks and Rec, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear you say uh, the, the what is it the, the Raiders, um, the football team and cheer, and also the uh, is it the uh, National Little League? Yeah. So that this is not a comprehensive list. Those were just the ones that were off the top of my head. Um, okay. But a, any community partner can set up a free account to send flyers. If they need help with setting up that account, they can reach out to me. I'm happy to help facilitate that. Um, our PR representative is awesome. She's very hands-on. Um, anytime that we've had an issue arise with the community partner, maybe incorrectly setting up an account, because it, sometimes it gets a little bit into the weeds. Um, she's She can go in there and she can help reset, reset their account. Um, it does take about a 24 hour period for the account to activate. Um, so if an organization wants to set wants to send a flyer, I would encourage them to start the process a couple of days ahead of time, um, just to make sure that their account is activated. And do we have that somewhere where they can, like, you know, not everyone's watching this video right now. Do we have somewhere on our website where it's, where it states that to reach out to you if they would like to go ahead and participate uh, in, in Peach Jar? Yeah, so under on the communications um, side of the website, the instructions are on there and the phone number that's on there, actually, I believe it goes directly to our Peach Jar representative. I can double check that, but my information is on there and then our, our Peach Jar contact is is on there as well. And, and if you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. And um, what are the possibilities too uh, of not just doing Peach Jar, but also uh, being able to promote their, you know, the programs that are, uh, that can be accessible to our students through our Facebook, our Instagram, and uh, our Twitter. Uh, could that be a possibility? I think it's definitely something that um, we could probably have a, a further discussion about. We probably need to make a policy surrounding um, that because we could get a little bit into the weeds of constantly having a lineup of external things to share and that overriding our internal successes that we would like to share and our internal information that we'd like to share. Um, so I, I see that as being a possibility with a certain amount of, of balance to it and parameters to it. So I think that's definitely an item for further discussion for sure. Okay, I'm writing that down. Thank you. And, and I, can, I can speak into just, you know, where, where, being somebody wearing multiple hats. Um, yeah, the, the, the PHR process for a community organization, you know, for my third place, it, it was relatively easy. Um, yeah, you were you were definitely helpful, Lika, so thank you, and, and prompt in the response, and so we were able to get that process signed up. One point of clarification that I think we ran into, and it's something to consider for Parks and Rec, and uh, maybe you can bring clarity on this. It's my understanding that for community organizations and or nonprofit organizations, uh, you have the ability to promote, um, you know, activities and services 
but they have to be free of charge. And so if, if Parks and Rec, for example, are promoting, a, I, I wonder how does this work? If they're promoting something and there's a $15 charge to be a part of, you know, mm -hmm. the, the park soccer team or, or, you know, football team or something, mm -hmm. um, are they then not able to um, share out? Because maybe that's where some of the um, con confusion comes around. But the process of getting onboarded was, mm -hmm. was relatively uh, straightforward and, and simple, uh, thanks to your help. So that, that is, and that is where the, the credits come in. So I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify this. So as a community organization, my third place can submit one free flyer per month, just in, in general. Um, beyond that, when you submit a flyer, um, that is where when I add credit to the my third place account, every time you guys um, submit a flyer beyond that one free flyer per month, no matter what the flyer content is, it'll just subtract from the credits that are on your account. Um, so essentially, Peach Jar just thinks that the organization is paying for the account, but they're not. The credits are just credits that we have that we can give to our close community partners. And, and just to clarify also, there's not an unlimited amount of credit. So we try to be um, we're very judicious about how we um, spread those around, but we have not yet come to a point where we've run out of credits to give to um, people during a period of, of time. So when you give the credits, um do the organizations need to be a uh, nonprofit or what is what, what is the guidelines? So the, the guidelines are created essentially by us. And what we have done so far is done only Azusa community organizations or organizations that have um, a close partnership with the district or extreme benefit to our students. Um, so like the Kumon Tutoring Center is not a, an institution that we would give our free credits to. If they want to advertise through Peach Jar, they can go through the public Peach Jar process um, and pay for their own credits. Um, but things like My Third Place, Homework House, Parks and Rec, um, Azusa City Library, those are the organizations that we would give credits to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then moving, moving forward um, on this point with developing and maintaining positive collaborative relationships with stakeholders, um, one of the things that we did pre-COVID-19 uh, and when I say pre-COVID-19, I mean like the week before um, everything shut down was we had sent out a, a mailer and on that mailer was a QR code for community members to receiving it to sign up for um, an email news list distribution because our plan was to start our community um, email uh, newsletter. Um, unfortunately, with COVID-19, I think that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and you know, people probably weren't paying too much attention to the mail that was coming in. And so we had had um, a limited amount of, of signups come in for our email list. Um, that doesn't mean that that's where it ends. That just means that once things go back to a more normal mode of operation, we will again um, continue with our push. Um, the mailer was push or phase one, I guess, of, of the push for signups for our email newsletter. Um, we have some people that we are of course automatically opting in <laughs> like our uh, local elected officials and um, our city partners and things like that. Um, I, this, so this item would probably be on the back burner for us just for a, a little bit until things settle down and we all have the more, um, we all have more capacity um, to, to operate on a more normal level than we are right now. Um, Can this code be put up on the website? It will be eventually. Um, I think right now with the atmosphere that we're in, there's probably things that are more important that we um, that we communicate, but I think maybe, you know, within the next month or so, we'll be ready to kind of get back to a level of um, somewhat more normal communications. Um, and we can work on, again, putting it out on the website, sending it out to parents, um, potentially doing another mailer, depending upon what, what our financial situation looks like. Um, we're not giving up on this push at all. This is definitely something that's on the forefront um, for us. But again, we're, we're just all being very cognizant, I think, of um, how burdened or, or unburdened people are feeling right now. Um, we don't want to add um, another thing, um, you know, to their to their to do list, because um, I think right now signing up for uh, another external newsletter would probably be low on people's priority list, and I, I completely get that. So I want to want to respect that. Um, so moving on um, to the next point that's on there: media utilization um, to maximize awareness and support for AUSD's goals, programs, and schools. Um, when I say media, um, I want to clarify to to mean. Um, this is all forms of media. I'm not just talking about digital media. It also includes um, print media. So some of the things that we have done is we've um, really worked on inter integrating our social media feeds for the district and schools um, with our school homepages and with the apps. So we have some people who probably don't have a Facebook account 
and maybe won't ever navigate to the Facebook website, but they will go to the school website. So we've made sure to have a prominent placement of all of our school social media accounts on the school website for ease of access for parents who may not be super familiar with social media. Um, and then we, we've continually updated the ASD website um, to meet new web accessibility guidelines for school districts. So this is this is a big one because the, the accessibility guidelines for websites are consistently changing. Um, and this is an area that is of particular importance, not just for AOSD, but for school um, for schools in general. And so we want to make sure that we are um, in compliance so that um, you know people who may need to use screen readers um, can access all of the content on our website. Um, the process is it's um, time consuming, uh, but it's one that is important and it's one that we are um, happy to spend the time um, on to make sure that we are in compliance where we need to be in compliance with. One of the, one of the um, good things about um, web compliance is that when we do switch to our new web platform, 90% um, of that work is built into the platform. So it will, it will be done for us, which will alleviate a lot of the burden um, for uh, Sam and I. Um, we've also created an, an Inside AUSD um, video series on YouTube. Our production has somewhat been halted since we um, you know, can't necessarily go to a site now and take photos and videos, um, but we'll start again afresh once we're, we're, we're back in our brick and mortar. Um, and again, those, the videos on YouTube are not just housed on YouTube. Those are things that can be shared on all of our social media sites and on our website for, for our community. Um, moving forward, as I mentioned, we are we were working on pre-COVID-19, um, a redesign of our AUSD websites. Um, that is still um, in progress, but again, um, it's one of the things that is better done um, in office. And since we are not in office right now, um, we don't necessarily have the tools that we need um, or the technology uh, that we need to, to be working on that. So our rollout will be slightly delayed, um, but it's still in progress and I'm still really excited about, about the switch. Um, and we're going to continue to learn and utilize the features on our digital marquees for exposure um, for AUSD programs and successes. So I know um, board member Rodriguez Pena had had some suggestions that we talked about, uh, about highlighting programs at each schools. And so um, we will continue to move forward with things like that. Um, and then we also want to work on a system. Again, this was a suggestion by um, board member Rodriguez Pena to um, de a system to deliver um, our, our print newsletter when we get around to doing our digital newsletter. Um, to key city locations, such as the library, city hall, um, rec center, and the senior center, because we do want to be cognizant of the fact that there are people who would prefer a paper copy of things, and we want to make sure that that's accessible and that we're taking it to um, that we're taking it to our taxpayers, as our, our board member put it. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, this was one of the things that we had started um, right before uh, COVID nineteen, um, and once we get back to more normal operations, we'll continue with that that push. Um, uh, moving on to, to media relations, this one is, I think, one that's uh, of particular importance and one that we've, again, had some success in um, with our local and national um, news spots that we've had. Um, so within the communications office, um, we've developed kind of a monitoring system using some free tools that Google has so that any time an AUSD school is mentioned within the news, we receive an alert within 24 hours. Um, it's normally much quicker than that. But just so we know, if there's something mentioned about us in the news that we didn't necessarily put out there, but somebody else is is commenting about us, um, we can keep tabs on on what those what those trends are. Um, and then um, we've maintained relationships with reporters who have covered positive stories within the district. So this includes our PBS contacts now, um, who came to us for Inside California Education, um, our Fox 11 and Good Morning America contacts. Um, and that's not to say that these contacts will grab hold of everything that we throw um, their way. Uh, but it's just a good tool for us to have in our pockets. So when we do have successes that we want to share on on that level, um, we have a, a wider variety of people to outreach to and a wider variety of people to share these things with. Um, and again, moving forward, um, we'll continue to, to pursue opportunities both on the local and the national level. Um, and we'll continue to share our news and our successes with our um, with our partners. And again, um, that's not to say that every press release we send out will be published. Um, but just keeping our names at the forefront um, of these reporters' minds is a good habit for us to have. Um, and then we'll continue to use social media as a platform to engage our media partners because that's one of the primary ways that they that they find news um, is they look through social media feeds to see to see what's trending. Um, Lika, excuse me. Yes. Did, did, did you ever contact uh, Mark from the Herald? I did. Yes. 
Um, I've sent him a couple of things, but uh, again, I think sometimes, you know, they have to pick and choose what it is that, that they're publishing. Um, but yes, I did. I told him that you, uh, you gave me his business card. Um, he was happy to, happy to. Great. That one. Yeah. 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 Um, and then just briefly on this last one, achieving coordinated communications, both internally and externally regarding safety issues and crisis management. Um, a big win for us here this year um, was having implemented and utilized Blackboard as a way to um, communicate when there are emergencies. So the district had not previously utilized Blackboard in this way, but what we did was we separated out contacts for staff at each site. So say you're at Dalton and Dalton happens to be in a lockdown. Um, we have the ability from the district level to send a text message to Dalton staff advising them that they are on lockdown. Um, we had a real world example when the district went on lockdown and we were able to send a text message to district employees telling them if you are not at the district office, um, you know, stay where you're at, we're in lockdown. If you are in the district office, please, please lock down. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that um, system is perfect. There are still, as we went through the real life situation at the district office, we realized there are, um, you know, people who have multiple work sites. And so, you know, maybe they are um, not at the district office all the time, or maybe they're at the district office and, and Dalton. So we're working with our um, Blackboard contacts to figure out how we can assign people to more than one site so that they are notified of an emergency um, at any site that they may have occasion to, to be at. Um, and again, these are, these are processes that will continue to develop, but I think that was um, a big win for us in terms of the safety of our, our staff and students. Um, so switching gears just, uh, just a little bit um, to briefly touch on some COVID-19 um, things. I think that there are a lot of lessons um, that we will be able to implement, a lot of lessons learned. Um, I think we've had some, some great success when it comes to um, the communications methods that we've employed and um, especially our engagement from the community. Um, but I think this really has done a lot to, to at least in my mind, um, you know, shape how we communicate going forward. Um, and learning the ways that parents prefer to be communicated with. Because I can look back at our reports and I can see, you know, more people access the app um, than access their email. Um, more, pe more people access text message than they do um, all calls. I can look and I can see, you know, who's, who's blocked us and what maybe some of the barriers are um, with communication. So I, I think that while this has been a challenging situation for, for all of us, I think coming out of the other end, um, we'll be able to analyze some of the things that we've learned um, and use it to, to better shape our communications moving forward. I think that's my last slide. Okay. Any well, questions? can I tell you that I, I, I really thank your um, presentation. I re recall your first presentation <clears throat> and all the things that you said you were going to do. While it seems like you're setting your goal, and I really appreciate that. That's really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to say that the compliments that I've had on the communication that we have been giving mm -hmm. leaps and bounds. It's, it is so amazing. You are, you all are doing a great job. Thank you. And I, I also actually, just to throw one last thing in there, um, many of you have met Sam Carlton, who also works in the communications office. Um, he was hired shortly after I was hired. Um, and I, I don't want to forget to, to mention uh, his position. He has done a lot to elevate the district's um, image within the district. So one of the things that I was able to do coming in was rewrite the job description for that position. So previously that position had been primarily administrative. Um, but that that after I had been in the position for a while, I, I knew that that was not what I needed personally and that was not the district needed. Um, we had been spending um, some funding on graphic design. And so my opinion was that the district would be very well served by hiring somebody who had some graphic design skills um, and Sam fit the bill uh, 100 percent. He's done a, a great job um, with, again, I, I say we jokingly say making things pretty, but it's much more than that because uh, the publications that we put out, our, our letterhead, our website, the appearance of our logo, all of that speaks volumes about, about our professionalism as a district. Um, and I need to give Sam a huge pat on the back for um, doing a lot to elevate the professional look of the district with his graphic design skills. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have, I have a couple a uh, couple quick questions. Um, so one, uh, I, I took notes as you were sharing, Lika. So one of the things that you said was uh, we only share our newsletter with the ZUSA addresses. Did, 
is are you saying literally 91702 or those within the Azusa school district jurisdiction? For those within the Azusa school district um, jurisdiction. Okay. Yep. Um, actually, you answered that already. And then uh, one, 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 other, one other thing, you said that we maintain relationships with people who post positive stories. Does that mean we don't maintain relationships with people who don't <laughs> pos pos pose positive stories? Um, no, just no. about how do we engage that? How do we, how do we get around, you know, get ahead of some? Yeah, of I mean, I would say that we, we engage them in, in the same way that we do the people who post positive stories. Um, they're, again, I mean, uh, you guys are, are probably pretty well aware, especially at this point, that media is always split. Um, there's always an extremely positive reaction and an extremely negative reaction, and the truth is always somewhere in between. Um, so I am not, I, I do not think it is a good practice to ignore um, any media partners or any community members, whether or not their opinion of us is favorable or, or unfavorable. But my personal goal for people who have an unfavorable opinion is to win them over, um, and that takes that takes time and that takes effort. And I, I won't say that opinions of us will change overnight, but I think that the more work that we put into um, showing our good side and the the more we treat people with grace even if their opinion of us is not very gracious that speaks volumes about our character and how we operate as a district and i think eventually that that works to soften people towards us i, I like jerry said I, li I like what you when you respond to facebook either if it's negative or positive but you have an answer or you you have a clarification you have to <laughs> understand and then they're you know they thank you later or or, or you know okay i get it kind of a thing right so that's really good yeah that have someone yeah okay uh shiloni you wanted to say something uh yeah am i muted let me see no i'm not muted. No, you're okay good. How, can you hear me yep okay um yeah, so just a couple of things. And before I ask my questions or make my comments, I just want to premise and say this is a very, it was a good, it was just a wonderful presentation. It gives me a very clear overview of the of the work and progress you have been able to make um, this year, especially around aligning our communication strategies, um, um, expanding our external communications piece. Um, and um, so, I, so I say I want to really appreciate that. Um, and I think that especially we've seen it very clearly with the community building you your team has been able to build um, under COVID-19. Um, so that being said, I do, and I, I always want us to continue to be better at everything. So I just do have a couple of questions. Um, and the first one is really around, um, so I, I think clearly we've been able to build, um, your, as a group, you, you've been able to build a sense of community on social media. Um, right now under COVID-19. So I'm just wondering how you're thinking about, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, if you have thoughts now, maybe, or later, how are we thinking about capitalizing that, on that creation of this feeling of community that we now have and closeness and connectedness with our, with our constituent, with our, not only our families, but even maybe a broader base, like how are we going to capitalize on that? So once we go back to, let's say, traditional school, how are we going to continue fostering that feeling of community that you've now created? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something, yeah, I, I have thought about it, and I, I won't say that I've come to, um, you know, in a solidified we're going to do X, Y, and Z. But I think one of the one of the reasons why our engagement has increased so much is that there is a new level of trust that our community has um, in us, and so I think that that will help them to continue to who want to be engaged with us. And not to say that that trust wasn't there before, but it is more evident now on both our side and their side that we are in this together as a partnership. And hopefully after all of this end, that partnership will be strong enough to, to continue. Um, I think that there are definitely methods that we have employed, such as like the, you know, the virtual spirit week, um, things where we're asking for interaction and then also responding and engaging um, that we had not done to the extent that we are now that we can continue to do because our community likes that. Um, you know, before our, our thought was we would not want to like burden anybody with communication or with requests or with things like that. Um, but this has been one of the primary ways that that they're responding to us. I mean, I'll, I'll you know, get up in the morning and I'll look at the, the Facebook notifications and we easily have 200 notifications, um, you know, in the morning. And then again, I clear them all out and in, in the afternoon we have 200, 200 more. Um, and so I think that speaks to um, our continued responsiveness, but then also just the trust and the reciprocal relationship that's been built as we're all trying to figure, 
figure this out. So, I mean, there are definitely things, like I said, that we can continue to think about. And I, I'm not going to say that we, I've, I've arrived at a, you know, we're going to do these definitive things. But um, I agree with you that this is something that we want, that we have captured, and now we want to keep. And so it's important that we figure out how we do that. Great, great. That's a great idea. And that's, I mean, that's awesome. So then my second question is really more about amplification, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think, and you sort of referenced this because you, you said made a point about, you know, what it's not just us, the two of us doing all this work, right? And so I'm just curious to see as now that you've been putting in the bones and really training, you know, and trying to include more people, how can we plan to have everyone in our district, whether it's site administrators, certificate of classified employees feel like they're part of our messaging team and really like they, everyone is part of our communication strategy. So not only feeling that, but also giving them the tools and training so that people feel comfortable sharing, whether it's on social media, you know, especially on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that one of the things that we can do is, as I mentioned before, we, we have worked with a team of um, administrators and principals to get them feeling um, semi-comfortable or somewhat comfortable posting on social media and we can implement that same thing um, on, on many other levels. Um, it was a little bit of a process to kind of figure out like, you know, how to implement that training, how to get people on board. Um, but I think at this point we have our system, you know, pretty well, our system of support pretty well established with Sam and I. Um, and that is something that is not exclusive to one group of people. Like it can easily be opened up to a wide variety of people within the district. All right, great, thank you. And then my last question uh, may not be actually directed at you, maybe it's directed at Linda, but I think that um, what we've, I, I mean, this is just my personal observation, right? I, I, what, I, what I think I, I feel like I've seen is very, it's somewhat uneven um, implementation in terms of how do, we, how do we communicate in a way that conveys our values of transparency and collaboration across all of our communications. Um, and I'll just use the, the example that we just had today, right? So today now the board had spent at least 20 minutes, if not longer, discussing the poor, the poor phrasing of a presentation, right? And so how can we make sure from the top to the bottom and bottom up that the messages that we're pushing out, whether it's a board presentation or messages to our staff or families are aligned to the values that we espouse and to make sure that we are um, using using, I would say, best practices when it comes to communication, narrative, um, those kinds of things. So I'm just wondering, and, so, and maybe like, I don't want to put a position, Lika, I'm not sure if this is an answer for question for you, but I do think I want us to, this may be a rhetorical question, I want us to think about how can we improve the areas where we see that unevenness? Mm -hmm. So I, again, I think it's probably one of those things that would require an answer from, from more than one person, but I definitely think that there are probably some maybe, um, I, don't wanna, I don't know if guidelines is the correct word, but maybe best practices. There are some best practices that we as a communications office can put together to share with everybody to think about. When you're making a public presentation, please consider you know, these factors. Um, please, and, and I, again, I, I think that I speak for, for all of us, board members, you know, cabinet, staff, teachers, um, it's never our intention to, to not be transparent, but I really think that we need to have a probably more critical lens when we're preparing these things and when we're looking at these things, because people don't come at it with the background knowledge that we have. And so while, while we may post something knowing the background information, we have to constantly be aware of the fact that on the other end, the public does not have the same information. Um, and it's not that we're intentionally trying to, to keep anything. It's not that we're, you know, intentionally trying to, to mislead anybody. It's just that it takes 100% extra effort to make sure that we are, yeah, that we, that we are making sure that people have the, the background that we have on things. That we're doing our best effort to communicate that, that background. So I definitely think that there are best practices that I can put together um, to share with everybody. And maybe we can use that as a building block uh, moving forward for for that, for transparency within the district. I would, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's really great. And I would just add, you know, even maybe think about training. So some people are just naturally those type of communicators. Some are not, I can speak for myself. I know that I'm not, but I've had significant training around messaging and I, you know, and I, and I can see just personally, right. The changes that I've been able to come to do because of the kind of training that I've received. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right, thank you. That was it for me. All right, any other questions? Anybody else? 
Okay, we'll move on to 10.4, 2019 to 2020 local control and accountability plan, LCAP update. Hello, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, President Bibles Vogel, board members, Dr. Kaminsky, cabinet members, and public, I'm very excited to join you this evening to share some information about um, Azusa Unified's LCAP, our <laughs> implementation for this year when we talk about that transparency and sharing what we're doing. That's a lot of uh, what we do with our LCAP process here in Azusa Unified. And I'm also gonna take some time to um, update you on some of the newest information coming out of the governor's office regarding the LCAP uh, timelines and, and requirements given our COVID-19 um, circumstances. So it, uh, I, I'm going to really share three uh, areas with you. Um, the first is around the 2019-2020 uh, district annual survey analysis. This is the first agenda or the first item attached to your board agenda item, this board agenda item. And the district annual survey is administered every year and it really allows us to gather information and input that drives the development and revisions of our LCAP. It provides data that helps us um, evaluate our current initiatives, our processes, our schools, our departments. Um, the survey really is the forum through which all stakeholders, our parents, our students, our staff can be part of the decision-making process um, in our district. Um, it is aligned with our five LCAP goals, but it also extends even beyond that as we gather information, feedback, and input. So this year we had 5,762 respondents to um, our survey, and this is the largest response rate to date. And in the report, you will find a breakdown of all of who those respondents are, who the parents were, students, and staff. Um, that kind of is outlined in the beginning of the report that was attached. Jennifer, also, do you want me to present this? Present? Your presentation, I mean. There's no slides. The, the attachments okay. are the actual reports. Okay. Yeah. So if, if somebody wants to address a specific area in one of the reports, I'm happy to share that screen. Okay. But there is no, there is no slide presentation because of the, the length uh, that it takes to go through all of that. Okay, all right. Um, so in addition to sharing the results from uh, the 1920 surveys, uh, there's also at, at the end of that report, a kind of a key, there's key takeaways at the, it, for each goal, but there's also a, a kind of significant year to year comparisons that I analyze and include in that report as, as well. And so um, our, our survey results are available on our district website. Um, in English and Spanish so that all of our stakeholders can see the outcome of the, the survey that they participated in. And of course it is used then to help us make decisions uh, in various areas. So the second document that was attached to tonight's agenda item is our 1920 LCAP April update. Um, as you recall, AUSD reports on LCAP implementation two additional times per year beyond what is required by the state. And those are our January update and this April update. And this is a real comprehensive report. Uh, it builds, the April update builds upon the information that was shared in January. Um, it provides metric updates as applicable for each goal, uh, gives expenditure updates for each goal, as well as each action and services, action and service in our LCAP. And there are descriptions of the implementation of each action and service for all five of the LCAP goals. And so that's another document that um, was shared with the board, is shared with the public, is translated in, in Spanish so that this information is accessible to all of our stakeholders. And I will be holding a PAC Plus meeting, virtual meeting, uh, tomorrow. And so these documents have been shared with those members and, and they'll have an opportunity to review and, and ask questions and again, provide their input. So those are the two attachments that you um, received uh, with this <clears throat> agenda item. I'm going to pause for a minute 
and ask if you have any questions or need clarification on uh, the district annual survey uh, analysis or the April update. Yeah. I do have a request. I don't have I don't have any question, but I do have a request. Um, since since the um, the LCAP meeting tomorrow is going to be electronic, and I think um, like the board can safely say that if they listen in, they none of us would participate and wouldn't break the Brown Act. Um, could you share Could you share that LCAP link with us? So if we have some time, we can each like we can drop in and see see what the discussion is. Yes, absolutely. I will send that out. Thank you. Um, and it, it will take place from 3.30 to 4.30. We're learning quickly that okay. being on meetings, as you can imagine, virtual meetings for long periods of time, the five hours uh, is, is probably a little too much for uh, all of us. So it's a one hour meeting and I will share that link with um, Kathy who will send it out to you. I see Adrian laughing because some of us are living on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Yep. So, um, <clears throat> I also wanted to take some time right now to update you on LCAP happenings. Last Thursday evening, uh, Governor Newsom released Executive Order N5620, which addresses the LCAP um, statute along with uh, some other related legal requirements. Um, up until this executive order, no changes to the LCAP timelines and requirements um, had were made um, because the LCAP is, a, is a, a statute and it cannot be changed or adjusted by just the California Department of Education. So the governor in, uh, was able to release that information. And today I had an opportunity to sit in with the California Department of Ed um, uh, officials who oversee LCAPs and really get a, a strong understanding of some of the changes that are going to happen with the LCAP because of the COVID-19 uh, school closures and the situations that all districts are involved in. So um, I'm going to share some of those details with you. The executive order uh, has postponed the deadline for the LCAP, uh, the 2021 LCAP and the budget overview for parents. Those things go together. And this has been postponed until December 15th. Normally, this is presented uh, to you and approved by you in June, along with the district's budget. So that, um, that LCAP document will be, again, coming to you December 15th, and that is for the 2021 LCAP and the budget overview for parents. And just so you know, uh, you might already know this, but that December 15th date is, is the date of the first interim um, report for budget, so that is intentionally coupled with that. And that's how that date was selected. So um, the document, uh, well, what, what will be required this June then is going to be a non-evaluative written report. Currently, CDE is calling it uh, the Operations Update Written Report. Now, I don't know if that name's going to change, but I thought I would share it with you in case you heard it. And this is going to be a written report um, to the community that outlines the following things. First, it's going to outline changes to our program offerings and expenditures due to the COVID-19 um, school closures. It will address the impact of our closures on students and families and how um, we have a district has, have addressed the needs that have arisen during this emergency situation. The report is also going to give an account of how we specifically continued to address the learning needs of our low income students, our English learners, and our students who are in foster care. Um, additionally, the out, we're going to outline how we developed and supported high quality distance learning for our students. And then also how we continued to provide meal services to our students during the physical closures of the schools. So this will be a written report um, that will be brought for your approval in June, uh, normally when we would bring the next year's LCAP. Um, and then we will be required to submit that as a, a final document to the Los Angeles County Office of Education for approval. Um, then just like with the LCAP, we will be required to post that uh, report in English and Spanish on our district website. 
Uh, and again, that's very similar. And it's exactly the process that uh, we do with our LCAP under normal circumstances. So you know that we, uh, the state had approved in January a new three-year template and we were scheduled to move into a new three-year LCAP cycle. And so as part of this executive order, that uh, new template and the three-year cycle will actually be pushed off one year and will begin and will cover now the years 2021-22 until the years 2023-24 and that will be the new three-year term. The actual LCAP that will be submitted in December will probably be a revised version of, um, of the template that, that we've used in the past. Uh, CDE and, and including the legislature have not decided exactly what that will look like. So I will keep you updated um, as necessary on, on what that will be uh, looking like for the December LCAP for the 2021 school year. In addition, the executive order also waived the requirement that the California School Dashboard local indicators be approved in conjunction with the LCAP in June. That was a new, a new requirement this year. And so that was waived because we won't, won't be bringing that LCAP in June as we would. And so that requirement um, will be waived. And those local indicators uh, will come to you at a later time, as well as any changes that may come down the line regarding the California School Dashboard and the accountability indicators um, for the 2020 uh, California School Dashboard. Those are still in the works. So at this point, uh, I'd like to ask you if you have any questions uh, or if you'd like me to clarify anything around the governor's executive order and the LCAP. Okay, anybody? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice seeing you. You too. Take yeah. care. Relax. <laughs> okay, we will move on to 10.5. Approve resolution 1920-43 order of biennial election of the Azusa Unified School District of Los Angeles County, California. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve 10.5. Okay, second. Second that. Motion. Okay, motion by board member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by board member Greer. Is there any discussion? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, passes 5-0. And now we will move on to approve 10.6, uh, approve resolution 1920-44, school board candidate statement. Do I have a motion? I, move I make a motion to approve 10.6. Second. Okay, moved by uh, board member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by board member Greer. Is there any discussion? All righty, let's go ahead and vote. <clears throat> and it passes 5-0. And now we will move on to 11.0 consent calendar. All matters listed on the con under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion in the format following the last consent calendar agenda item. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time the board, staff, or the public requests specific items to be discussed. If discussion is requested by a board member, that item will be removed from the consent calendar and will be considered separately. The superintendent and staff recommend approval of all consent calendar agenda items. So do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. A motion by board member Ariana, seconded by board member Cruz Gonzalez. Any discussion? Okay, let's vote. And it passes 5-0. And next we will move on to uh, 
13.1 human resources public hearing on the collective bargaining agreement proposal for negotiation between the California School Board Asso Employees Association chapter two, number chapter 299 CSEA in the Azusa Unified School District CSEA proposal. To make a motion to approve 13.1. Second. Okay, uh, motion by board member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by board member Greer. Anybody want to discuss? Okay, seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and vote. And it passed 5 0. Next, we will move on to 13.2, Board of Education Adoption of the California School Employees Association Chapter 299 CSEA Collective Bargaining Proposals for the 2020-2021 Fiscal Year Negotiations. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve 13.2. I second. I second. Okay, uh, motioned by board member Rodriguez Pena, seconded by board member Arianas. Any discussion? All right, let's vote. Pass this And now we will move on to uh, just a second, lost my screen. 14.0 Business and Finance, 14.1 Approval of Resolution 1920-45, Designation of Applicants Agent Resolution for Non-State Agencies. I have a motion. I'm um, like motion. Second. Okay, motion by board member Cruz Gonzalez, seconded by board member Greer. Any discussion? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Can you please, can you please, can you please, can you please explain this? Um, so this resolution is, um, gives us the opportunity to apply for aid from Cal OSHA. Um, which would be the emergency aid provided through the feds to Cal OSHA. And um, this is the beginning process. Um, we've already submitted our application to see if we can receive some funding to make up for the revenue loss due to COVID-19. Um, we need to pass a couple of resolutions and this is, this is one of them. Uh, so can I ask a question? So I can I make a comment, a request? Um, since it's it's it's, it's um, connected, um, it's connected in a way. Um, so along these lines, is there several districts across the state have been passing resolutions, um, um, asking both at the state and federal level to to support at, um, at local education with additional dollars and during during this crisis. So can I ask make a request from staff that? You research some of these re these re um, resolutions and bring back one for us to vote on at the next board meeting. Absolutely. Any other comments? Okay, let's vote. And it passes five zero, and then we're going to go to fourteen point two, which would be. Approve the Voluntary Retirement Incentive Plan for Permanent Certificated Non-Management K-12 Bargaining Unit Members. Do I have a motion? Motion to move this, mo I, I motion to move this. Okay. Second. Okay, motion by Board Member Arianas, uh, seconded by Board Member Greer. Do we have any discussion or questions? Okay, well then I guess we'll just vote.
And it passes 5-0. And um, at this point, we're concluding the open session at uh, 10 I have a question. Like to go back. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a question. Um, from what the uh, Azusa City Council voted on yesterday, um, is there any discussion that uh, we, it should be taking place, Linda? For, for the yard signs? Yes, yes, I'm very excited to see this happening. And uh, uh, Sergio and I will be coordinating the work that needs to happen to make this come, come about. We're very, very excited about it. And well, so, to clarify, to, to clarify, Linda, you said, I, we spoke earlier about this also, you, you said there's no board action necessary for, to, to move this forward. We were able to, to yeah. move forward. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Will, will we be doing so half? Uh, what what was the question? I'm sorry. I, the The rest of my question was: If money is involved, do we not have to approve um, money? If we're going to go ahead and participate in this, do we not have to, as a board, approve how we're going to go ahead and pay for this for our students? Um, we would approve it the next time the when the item comes on the um, the uh, purchase orders. The, you know, the, the item that we have every time on the board the consent calendar, it's the purchase orders and warrants. So that's where the item would be listed in there. Once we know the company and, and you know, how the costs are going to go. Uh, Sheila, so maybe, I, yeah, maybe we can just invite our mayor to come to our next board meeting to yeah. thank him. Okay. That, that also is um, the teacher of the year meeting too. Right. I, I, I agree with my colleague, uh, Shanoline Cruz um, Gonzalez, that we should invite the mayor as um, moving forward with this. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, so uh, now we're going to go into closed session and everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you for attending.